Yeah. All right. Uh, William says hi to everybody. He's waving from the background. Hi, William. Oh, William. Oh. Hi, William. How are you? He's, he just, uh, we just got a note from his school and it said that, uh, oh, it said a student in his class has tested positive for COVID. So he was kind enough to bring it home to me. <laughs> and, and now, and now he's got to stay home for 14 days. And I guess I do too, huh? Tested. My son, my son got the same note. Get tested. Second time. Yeah. Okay, everyone, good luck. Have a good evening. Okay. Okay. Pleasure to meet you. Okay. Oh. Uh, James, you got your mic on. Good. Very good. Okay, oh, Madam Clerk, okay. would you please call the roll? Yes, Mayor. We're starting the meeting at 7.01 p.m. Mayor Burkett? Here. Vice Mayor Paul? Here. Commissioner Salasauer, it's absent. I don't see her. Commissioner Castle? Present. Commissioner Velasquez? Here. Here to the quorum. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any additions, deletions, or linkages that they'd like to uh, bring up? I do. I'd like to defer the uh, the homeless issue. I'm waiting for a little more information that has not come in. I expected it by now, but I don't have it, so I'd like to put it back on for the next meeting, if that's okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Then... Uh, I don't think we have any community notes that I'm aware of. Oh, I, uh, go I, ahead, Vice Mayor. Go ahead, Tina. Yes, I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, many members of our community are mourning right now. I just wanted to ask if we could have a moment of silence for um, our resident Moshe Behar, who passed away. Um, he was a neighbor. He was a friend to many and a husband, a uh, father. So if we could just have a moment of silence to honor him. Okay, we'll do it. Thank you for that, Tina. Yes. Uh, is uh, Senator Pizzo with us this evening? No, Mayor, we got a message earlier today that he had a conflict at, of scheduling right now. He may join us later, but he's not going to right now, so. Okay, great. Oh, uh, can I say something? You may. Uh, yes, I just wanted to um, see if we also had FPL on the phone or on the line because there was um, a couple of statements that were made uh, regarding the undergrounding of the power lines that were- Okay, let's ask that question, Nellie. Let's see, Mr. Manager, does, is FPL on the line? Yes, I, I've, I've verified that they are on the meeting. So- we can Okay, great. Well, when the time comes. They're, they're up uh, right after uh, your next item, which is uh, a presentation by the manager. Yes, um, it's no surprise, and it, it would probably have been a, a lot more effective in person, but. I want to present you with what you already have in your hands, your your ceremonial check for your 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 hard earned dollar for the year. Uh, if you'd hold them up, so we could all kind of have a have them recorded. But oh, uh, I didn't. I didn't thank bring. You, thank you. We 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 all. Do I'll be thank right you. back. <laughs> we all do. Thank you for your work. So thank you so much for all you do. And I um, um I hope uh, you know the next year is equally as as um, prosperous for each of you. Does it does it make a difference that mine's crooked and the vice mayor's is not? Yes. Uh, I, I I I know I did not prepare them. You'll have to ask All someone right. who did. All right, I'm I'm coming I'm coming over there. There's a there. <laughs> Lock the door. The mayor especially prepared for him. Um, uh, I know you guys love me. Okay, but, thank mayor, you, Andy. If I, if I could just introduce Jim, Jim real quick. There's Nellie. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Jim McGinnis, our, our new building official, this is the second day. He has hit the ground running. Um, I've kind of pushed him out the nest really quick, uh, but we're, we're really excited. Uh, he uh, Lily dropped by yesterday and 
got to meet with him and we hope uh, to have an opportunity for you guys to meet individually with him and to get to know him a little bit but uh, he's a welcome addition to our team welcome and aboard we're really excited about uh, him being here and I, I believe you know if, if you allow him to speak for 15 seconds if he can um, um, you'll find out how excited he is to be joining us okay. all day. Jim, Thank you have you. the floor. Is it Thank Jim you. or James? Which Jim. one is it? Jim, Jim. Okay. Here, you're building official. It's an honor and a great pleasure to be selected to serve the town of Surfside and serve each of you and the citizens and the contracting community out there. Very exciting. You've got a tremendous team here, great professionals. I'm really proud and very excited to be a part of it and a leader amongst them. And uh, we intend to raise the levels of professionalism here and service in the building department. Very excited to hear your feedback on that. I, I see a few things on the agenda about that. And we're here to listen and, and serve and uh, very happy to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. We're happy to have you too. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Manager. Uh, next item is the FPL update. Yes, they're online. Um, Chris? I will promote them. Okay. I like Christopher Ferreira. They're going to be discussing the undergrounding and um, kind of bring us up to date and give us a status report from their perspective and what the plan was from FPL and kind of answer a few questions that were really kind of raised from the senator's visit last uh, last month. Got it. Chris, if you'll introduce yourself and your members of your team, please, sir. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. I also have uh, Shonda Young and Ray Lozano from FPL. If they can also be promoted, that would be great because uh, they're going to help me answer some questions and provide any information that I may miss. Okay, and while and while that's while that's happening, uh, good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, and Mr. Manager. Uh, my name is Christopher Ferreira. I am a Senior External Affairs Advisor with Florida Power and Light. And I am uh, one of the representatives assigned to the town of Surfside. Um, thank you for the opportunity of having us on tonight and provide some clarification and some additional information as to the different programs that FPL has uh, that we're doing as part of our initiatives to deliver uh, clean, affordable, and reliable energy to our customers. Um, I think the, the most important thing is to say that there's two different programs that we're talking about here. And I hope that with what we'll give you, the information we'll give you tonight, will help distinguish and clarify the differences between the two programs and provide you the information that the town needs to make the best decision for your residents. Um, as I mentioned, there's two programs. There is what's called the Storm Protection Plan, which is uh, part of FPL's initiatives to harden and strengthen the electric grid, uh, as we've been doing for about the last 15 years, and make our service more reliable. And as part of that protection plan, there is a component that is called the lateral hardening slash undergrounding program. And it's important to know that lateral lines are not every power line that you see out on the street. They're broken up into two different categories, which are uh, on our distribution system, which are our feeder lines and our lateral lines. Currently, the town of Surfside's uh, feeder to lateral ratio is about a little bit more than 50% of the lines are feeder lines and a little bit less than 50% of the lines are lateral lines. Uh, under this program, which has been approved, uh, FPL does not only just uh, hardening, we harden and replace in, uh, electric poles. So we might put stronger wood poles or stronger concrete poles along our power lines. We also do vegetation management. We also do pole inspections and various other projects or programs that we have to harden the system. This program, as I mentioned, has been going on for a while. Uh, recently, there was a change before the program's cost were recovered through our base rates. And recently, I believe starting this year, the program costs were changed to what's called a recovery clause. And what's important to note is that there's no uh, fund or grant or surcharge uh, that is being applied to town of Surfside customers for overhead underground conversion of power lines. The recovery clause, the way it works is that we uh, incur costs for doing these improvements to electric grid and we didn't have to go to the Florida Public Service Commission to recover uh, the expenses for these costs and recover the, the cost through this recovery clause. So I think that's important to mention. Uh, that is the storm protection plan. Now there's a separate program called the overhead underground conversion program, which is what the town has currently been working on with FPL, 
which is to take, um, which can take feeders and laterals, which is what the town is currently asked of FPL to design. Um, so to design all the feeders and laterals within the town limits and underground them. In this program, there's also coordination with other utilities or other, other carriers that are on the power poles, such as AT&T, Comcast, Atlantic Broadband, uh, other communication carriers that are attached there as well. Under that program, the town uh, requests FPL to put together a, a ballpark estimate, which we've provided. It's about $6.7 million for the electrical facilities uh, to be converted underground. And we can also work with the town for the town to manage different aspects of the project. Um, what I think was important also to mention, I forgot to mention this earlier, is that the storm protection plan currently with the, the criteria that's put in, the, the undergrounding portion is currently in a pilot program phase through the end of 2022. We, are, we have worked and put together a plan, a long-term plan to look at our entire system and see what laterals will be undergrounded with the criteria approved by a public service commission. And currently the, the laterals that are in the town of Surfside are scheduled for 10 plus years out from today. Under the overhead underground conversion program, the town has more discretion as to the timeline uh, from the moment the project is, is commenced and put into, into motion, the project timeline is about three to four years. Um, that's really what I had for right now. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Shonda and Ray to chime in if I missed anything or if there's any additional information that they wanna cover. Uh, and then we can, I guess we can go to some questions. Okay, Chandra, your microphone is off. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, Chris um, really did a pretty good job of covering it. I will um, note that, um, so the pro project that we re recently or have been um, working forward um, with your consultant, Paul Abbott on. So up until now, we have provided a ballpark estimate for the um, undergrounding of all the facilities within inside Surfside, which include the feeder and the lateral lines. And, um, at this point, we're at a. Um, we are. The next step is to pay the engineering deposit and provide CAD files for FPL to proceed with the actual um, design of that um, and layout of that um, that scope. That process takes approximately um, three to six months. Um, we provide you um, equipment locations, and then from there, we would then negotiate those locations, make sure everything's in a good spot. Then we would proceed with providing a binding cost estimate. So that's where we are in the process. Um, there are a couple aspects that uh, Chris mentioned as far as managing the uh, construction component of it. There's an option for FPL to do all of the work, all of the underground work and all of the overhead work. There's an option for the uh, town to actually um, do some of the underground work. FPL would still do all of the uh, all of the overhead work, but some of the underground work could be done by the city and. Typically that happens because you wanna coordinate with all the other utilities. Uh, so that, that's really at a high level where we sit with the project at this point. So uh, we're ready to start the design when um, the town is ready. And then um, we would proceed with the rest of the project. The three to four year time frame really just um, is a window. Um, I've seen some projects get done in a couple years, but it just really depends upon if there's any other coordinating um, infrastructure that needs to go in at the same time. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Ray, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, uh, no, thank you. I think you did a great job um, giving an overview. Uh, again, my name is Ray Lozano. Thank you for having us. Um, the project controls manager for the lateral hardening underground program. So, Great. Okay, Nellie? I was trying to do, uh, unmute myself. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I just wanted to clarify because in the last meeting that we had, there was a comment about um, our town or our residents already paying for this in their utility bills and that eventually we would get this project done pretty much for free um, or you know, through the, through the payments that our residents had already been making. Um, and we had our conversation the other day that that, that is incorrect. Um, I just want to make sure that that we clarify that um, FPL is not going to give us this for free, and that what is our timeline to be even considered 
for any of this. I, th I think someone mentioned the other day in our meeting, I think it was um, 2037 to 2047 or something like that, 30, 40 years from now. Um, because I just, I just want to make sure that we're clear that we have to pay for our project and um, not that we're going to get well, this. Let me, let me interrupt you right now, Nelly, and just ask, you know, I, I think that's a good point. So the question is, 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 is there any circumstance where FPNL would have paid for the cost to put the lines underground? And uh, it was asserted at the last meeting that there potentially is a program they could do that. Is that correct? So uh, thank you for the question. And, and if I can expand further on what I mentioned earlier about the recovery clause uh, by which these costs are covered. So over the last 15 years, um, including going forward for the next uh, round of hardening, these expenses are incurred by FPL. We then go to the Florida Public Service Commission and present the costs to them and have to justify them. And those costs are then passed on to customers to be paid back. Um, all all 5.6 million customers for Florida Power and Light, all the way from North Florida down to South Florida, pay for uh, the hardening and programs and initiatives. Um, these are these were before included in our base rates. Moving forward, they'll be in a recovery clause, which is a a separate um, a separate portion or a separate uh, discussion that we have with the Public Service Commission. Now the lateral undergrounding program, as I mentioned, will only cover laterals, right? So uh, a little bit more than half of the town is comprised of feeder or served by feeder lines. Um, under the program, under the storm protection plan, there are plans to underground the laterals, but not out until more than 10 years from now um, in our plan. As I mentioned also, the program is currently in a pilot phase through 2022, and we have to go back to Public Service Commission to get approval to extend the program. Well, let me beyond ask you a couple of quick questions, Christopher. So um, are Surfside residents paying into this fund right now? It's not a fund, it's, it's a it's a clause, it's a charge that's okay, well, added to let, the rate. Let me, let me rephrase that. Is the town of Surfside residents paying anything into the clause or the recapture fund, what, whatever it's called? All, all FPL customers pay into the clause and to and to cover the cost for hardening. Okay, so if if a town like Sunny Isles elects to pay, to move forward, and they don't want to wait ten years, and they fund, I guess they're doing underground, correct? The city of Sunny Isles Beach is currently in an overhead to underground conversion project. Okay, so with res and they're still they're they're obviously gonna they're gonna fund that themselves, correct? Yes, they they are they have paid for portions of that of that right. project, and there are additional phases that are underway that they will be paying for. Right. Are, are you guys paying for any of that? No. So as part, of, no. So, but as part of our, as we have discussed in the past, and I will, believe it was last year, as part of our tariff, there is a credit that is applied to uh, the charges or the expense. I guess the the expense for the project that the town or the city paid, well, and that's so that where credit I was will going. be applied. Yeah. So that's where I was going. So if the residents of Surfside are paying anything into that fund, whether it's by tax or tariff or however, um, there will be a calculation should we decide to go forward with the undergrounding ourselves and not wait 10 years where they would sort of, uh, practically speaking, recoup some of that money that they're going to be paying in the, in the, in the well, form of a less expensive sort of uh, project. Sure. So, so currently, FPL's tariff has a has a credit that is applied to the the cost for the municipality's voluntary conversion from overhead to underground, based on the scope of the project. And these take these credits take into consideration uh, the lower operating and maintenance costs associated with underground power lines. So that that credit will be applied per our tariff, which our tariff and all of our uh, costs that we charge our customers are approved by the Public Service Commission. So that. So for the for the residents of Surfside, um, uh, after the conversion is done, they will have a, a credit applied against the tariff. Is that kind of what you're saying? No. Chris, do you want me? To, Chris, do you want me to help with this? Sure, if, if you so, can, if you can better explain. It. So there's two total. There's two separate programs. There's the overhead underground conversion, and then there's the storm protection plan. The storm protection plan is the um, is the clause recovery. 
So as FPL executes work under that plan, we recover, we go to the PSC and we're allowed to recover through uh, that clause. So that's totally in separate from the overhead to underground conversion program. So when we go through the process of giving a binding cost estimate for the overhead to underground conversion program, there will be credits applied to the project and the pro, uh, for overhead to underground conversion that take into consideration the um, uh, cost to maintain overhead facilities versus underground facilities. So there's the two programs are completely separate. Okay, good. So that was okay. the first program. What's the second program? No, the first program is the S, the storm protection right. plan. Right, you and talked the, about that. What's the second one? The overhead to underground conversion program that we've been working with the, um, the town now on moving forward with, it's the voluntary program. So there's the voluntary program and the storm protection. The storm right. protection will happen and the clause will recover whatever the PSC um, approves. The overhead to underground conversion has its own set of credits associated with the program. So there's how, not a, a well, credit. I got that. So how does, how, does, how does that work generally? How do those credits work on the, under, on the overhead to underground? So for the overhead to underground conversions, um, we take into consideration the operation cost of underground versus overhead. Um, also, there's a voided storm recovery cost. So if there's a storm and we have overhead, obviously we have to deploy um, brief, uh, troops to restore power. Well, when the facilities are underground, you typically don't have to have as much restoration costs. So because we're avoiding those restoration costs, that avoidance is credited in the project. So when we um, when we sent over the ballpark estimate, we sent over a copy of the tariff. It has line item by line item what we charge for and what we credit for in order to come up with the calculated cost. And that's been part of the tariff since it was created um, over All right. 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. I think that I want to bring in, we have, I'll get you Charles in a second. Um, before I get the, the speakers, I see Mr. Abbott has got his hand up and he's our consultant and he may be able to shed some more light on this issue. And I want to hear from him now, Charles, do you want to hear from him first or would you rather speak first? Um, no, we can hear from him first. Maybe he'll give okay. some context. Okay. Uh, uh, Sandra, why don't you bring Mr. Abbott in first, please? Here, Paul, I would please do your name and address for the record in your comments, please. You can unmute yourself. Did that work, or is that work now? That works. Thank you. I apologize. I always struggle with these zooms. I tried to do it on my computer, and unfortunately, I'm holding my iPhone in my hand, so you're probably all getting seasick from it bouncing around. It's um, perfect, Mr. Abbott. You're good. Uh, my name's Paul Abbott. The name of our company is HPF Associates. I am the president of that company. Uh, our corporate office is located at 14803 Southwest State Road 45 in Archer, Florida. Um, we have been involved with uh, utility undergrounding um, FPL programs for, for many, many years. Uh, most recently, we are the consultant on the Sunny Isles Beach Project that someone re referenced earlier. I think the simplest way to say this is what what, what Shonda and, and, and uh, Chris alluded to, when you elect to do a conversion project, there are costs that, as, as she said earlier, I think your ballpark estimate is somewhere $6.8 million. The credit that's being discussed is incorporated into that estimate or into the fees that the town will ultimately play, pay to FPL. It, 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 in a round number, it's about 25%. Um, and that 25% takes into account depreciation of current FPL equipment that has certain value. You'll note that most of the equipment in the town of Surfside is antiquated. It's, it's very, very old. So there's very, very little depreciation value in any of the equipment that they remove. But the simple way to think about this is that when we get an invoice from FPL for the underground 
to uh, overhead to underground conversion, there will be a credit and generally it runs about 25% of the value of the project. There are other, there are multiple ways to save money. Shonda alluded to it earlier. That's by the town taking on a portion of the work by putting in the conduit and the, 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 the concrete product, which are the foundations are the chambers that the FPL equipment sets on. FPL only FPL are their approved vendors will then come in and install the conductor, install the equipment, the fuses, the switches, the capacitors, et cetera, and make the final terminations to make the underground system live. The benefit to the town of doing a portion of them work themselves and by themselves, I obviously mean a bid project to certified contractors. I'm not going to expect Randy and his public works crew to go out and put conduit in the ground, is that we can use the technology where we can share locations. We can put the FPL conduit in the ground. We can provide the, the, the prescribed separation between those conduit. And then we can put in the Atlantic Broadband, the AT&T, and the other low voltage providers in that same trench, eliminating multiple excavations for multiple utility companies. I, I don't want to get into too many details because it can be very confusing, but I hope that gives you a clear overview of how the town would approach a conversion project. It does. Mr. Abbott, why don't you stay on the line um, just in case uh, the vice mayor or commissioners have a question. Charles, go ahead. You wanted to make a comment? Yeah, yes, thank you, sir. Um, it's clear that, um, you know, as the residents of Surfside voted that we, we want the undergrounding. Um, I just want to make sure that it's done where we get the most bang for the buck and the best investment long term. Um, and long term is clearly um, inclusive of the storm protection and hardening program that's in effect now. And then it's inclusive of the overhead to undergrounding project that the regulatory authorities have yet to really green light. Um, so my question is, what is Surfside slated to get under the current storm protection and hardening um, 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 initiative that's been approved? And when is that coming? If I may speak to that, am I still? Yes, on? yes at, go ahead. At a, at a meeting we had last week with the manager and other staff and uh, FPL participated online. Um, it was identified, and I believe it was Ray who is currently on tonight, identified that the hardening uh, lateral project is right now scheduled for Surfside to occur in 2037 to 2047. So put that in perspective in, in the time frame. I won't be here for that because I would be 100 years old come that time. Um, I, I won't say that some of the younger members of your commission won't be around, but I would say that if you want to protect your community from the, the, the ravages of hurricane storms, underground to uh, overhead to underground conversion is the prudent investment of resources. And if at a later time, the Public Service Commission says, yes, the lateral program would in fact result because you went ahead and invested in the community. I'm not saying that is happening at the present time, but is there a possibility 20 years from now that the tariff configurations and all of the shared expenses could change? Certainly, lobbying uh, efforts, the, the entire legislative effort could, could present money, but right now, the lateral program does not benefit the town of Surfside. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor. So, uh, I'm, yes. I'm sorry. I, if I, oh, if, if I could just ask, jump in for just okay, sure. one quick second. I'm sorry. I, I just want to clarify. So, so under the storm protection plan, the lateral hardening slash undergrounding program or pilot is a component of it, but there are other components of it as well. There's the pole inspection program. There's the feeder hardening program. There's the wood structure hardening program, vegetation management. All those are things or programs that benefit all customers throughout our system, right? So investments in hardening the system, which reduce restoration 
efforts later on, uh, reduce operation and maintenance expenses for FPL, or at the end of the day, pass along to customers in, in, in through our entire state, right? Um, and what I guess the biggest point is, is to separate that the overhead on the ground conversion program and the SPP program are two separate programs. The storm protection plan is funded through this recovery clause that recovers costs at FPL expense every year on the program. And there's the overhead on the ground conversion program that has a tariff and a, a credit system that's applied to it or that's, that's part of the tariff approved by the Public Service Commission. I just wanted to add that clarification. And to, can I just ask comment. directly to the FPL reps, is that true what the consultant just said that Surfside isn't slated to get anything from the hardening until 30, until 2037? Hi, this is Ray, can so, you guys hear me? Well, hang on, Let's, yeah. I think that question was to the consultant, to Mr. Abbott, oh. right? I was merely repeating what was said to me at a meeting last week. I would like Ray to address that comment, please. I was just gonna say the same thing, please, Ray. Okay, go ahead, Ray. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so based on the objective criteria from the Public Service Commission that they've blessed off that helps evaluate which feeders are going to get worked on next based on worst performing, which laterals are going to get worked on next based on worst performing and on, yes, the Surfside Normandy laterals are not scheduled based on the current criteria uh, until about that time frame, 10 plus years out. That's correct. Oh, just just for fun, Ray, what, what areas would be scheduled for immediate attention? Well, are they, they non-oceanfront yeah. areas? Well, it's, it's objective criteria, right? So they look at they look at outage experiences that occur during Hurricane Matthew and Irma. Then they look at the total number of vegetation outages experienced over the last 10 years. And then they look at a different subset of lateral and what's called transformer outages also over 10 years. They look at it from a feeder level across our entire service territory. And they, it's, 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 a, it's an analysis and it's weighted at the feeder level. And that's how it's calculated. So, so I mean, I presumably, don't so presumably Surfside's been less impacted than a lot of other areas. Is that that's correct? That's correct. That's correct. Now, yes, that is correct. So over time, right, things could change. Hurricanes come randomly every year and affect us differently every year. So there is a chance that Surfside can move up and down the rankings, right, based on this objective criteria. Um, will they move to within two, three years? I can't say, right? So. Got it. Got it. Did that um, answer your question, Charles? Um, yes, yes, it does. And uh, just the, the second part of my question has to do with um, if going forward, the, uh, the, the um, overgrounding to undergrounding project um, is adopted by the regulatory bodies, um, and that could be a few years from now that they adopt an action plan um, to roll out in your right, depending on what might happen between now and then, including the political climate and changes there. Um, but I just am wondering if Surfside buys into this now, what's to say that some of the, um, the guiding principles for undergrounding might then change when they actually unleash the master plan and we might be, be then doing this again. Uh, for example, I know the height of the boxes is open for debate um, the higher they are, the more resilient they are to floods and um, and the future of rising sea levels. So at this point, we'd be making our best educated guess um, on, on what we want to do based on the the uh, the costs and the benefits and that analysis. Is it? But um, is that a question or a statement? Um, yes, the question would be: Is 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 the would the technology and the and the uh, parameters change then possibly going forward? And what's your feeling about that? Okay, and then I want to get to Tina. Go ahead. Who can answer who's that the, question? Chris? Yeah, who's that right? question? If, if I, I mean, understood I, correctly, you're asking if the standards would change drastically between now and the future for the installation of electrical equipment. Is that the question you were asking? Um, yes, such that uh, we might be, might be biting the bullet on a project, and then when the full undergrounding goes forward, there are some criteria that are more stringent or different and then require adapting later on. 
I'm not an expert in this. You guys are the experts, and that's why I asked. Is that possible? Well, and 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 I think Charles, you obviously the the most important part of your question is, if adaptation was necessary, who would be responsible for the cost? Right, and what kind of a um, you know a, an impact that would have again if we had to redo infrastructure again? Okay, let's see if we can get an answer to that. If I may, so. Uh well, go ahead, Chris. I, I was just going to say, I mean, we at, at FPL and most electric utilities across the country follow the National Electric Safety Code, and there are standards that are set there that we have to follow. Um, I don't know that we can speak to how those standards will change in the future. I'll, I'll defer to Shonda and Ray if they have uh, different thoughts on that. Um, but Shonda, correct me if I'm wrong, once the system is built and turned over to FPL, FPL owns, operates, and maintains the system uh, going forward, correct? Correct. So any any adjustments or any uh, improvements made to the system will be done by FPL, right? Yes. Okay, okay I think that answers the question. I don't know that question. helps answer your question. I, I think that answers the question, thank you. Uh, Tina, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so my question actually is to uh, Mr. Paul Abbott. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, how, you know, I don't know how in depth he's gotten into our project yet. And if he's looked into, I believe there were conduits put in underground during the um, water sewer uh, project that was done in 2012, 13. And I wonder, are, the, are those still valid? And do we, do we, you know, do we have any assessment of those, uh, you know, as far as how that would work as far as credit wise, um, having a step done already, just kind of wondering about that. My, my honest opinion, uh, number one, maybe for a little bit of history. I've been involved with Surfside since 2009, 10. The first time this really came to serious consideration, uh, HPF and Associates is actually who prepared your initial cost estimates with input from the utility providers. So I would say that I am intimately familiar with the, resi the single family residential portion of Surfside. Uh, and yes, we absolutely believe that the conduits that were placed, they were only placed at the intersections. They aren't randomly throughout the residential area. It's just when the road was disrupted for the, uh, the, the public works project, conduits were placed in coordination with where the other subsurface um, utilities were being uh, uh, installed to, to facilitate not having to encounter those elements, water lines, storm sewer, sanitary sewer lines. It would certainly be the design intent to reutilize those, make use of those conduits. I will be honest with you, the one question that I don't have uh, answered at yet, but this is the process that we're in right now, is whether or not conduits were placed for the low voltage. By low voltage are, are the communications I'm referring to, the AT&T, Atlantic Broadband, et cetera. I'm not sure if those conduits were placed at the same time, if only the FPL conduits were in. It doesn't demean in any way the advantage and the value of the FPL conduits, understand FPL is always at the bottom of the trench, meaning that if we put in a trench that's a what we call a common trench, FPL will be four foot in the ground. There will be a foot of barrier um, uh, ground fill before the other uh, ut um, um, utilities come in, the communication utilities. When those sleeves were put across the intersections, it, they were put in so that the proper clearances were maintained with the other underground utilities. Sorry to make it such a long-winded answer, but yes, in fact, those conduits have value. I'd like to step back to the previous question for one minute. We have already in, in, in seen improvements of underground technology. Initially, underground units were served by one sort of a few, uh, a, a switch. There is now new technology, re more recent technology called the VISTA system. You'll see that in your cost estimates. These 
Vista switches are more tolerant to storm conditions. They're also more, um, they're, they're lower profile, they're less obtrusive to their locations. These same things will potentially happen with fuses, uh, capacitors, all the other elements that are involved in an undergrounding project. It's just like saying today, what technology is available in the Wi-Fi system or the internet Mr. system? Mr. Abbott, um, yep. I, I think so, Vice Mayor, I think you had your question answered. I think to the extent that they can be used, they will. And it sounds like they're, they're in the intersections uh, and uh, I, I guess we'll have to do an assessment at some point, won't we, once the roads start getting uh, dug up for the uh, FPL lines, the main lines, we'll find those, uh, those other sort of translational lines. The Public Works Department has as-built documents that identify those lines. So we will do preliminary investigation before we actually start the physical installation to confirm the whereabouts of these sleeves and their utilization. Okay, good, thank you. Thank and you very much. Anybody else have any questions well, before I, just, I go to the- I also wanted to ask a FPL question. Go ahead. So, um, so I had spoken with Chris about a year ago about um, what the Public Service Commission was recommending. So I didn't realize we were that far away from it. Uh, 10, 10 to 17 years is a long time. Um, just so there were no plans for Surfside at all for, for like the next 10 years? Based on the based on the the objective criteria that Ray mentioned earlier, um, once that analysis was done, that is where the the laterals the lateral power lines in Surfside fell. And okay. that, that criteria was approved by the Public Service Commission, and it's something that we have to abide by as a regulated utility. Okay, thank you. I, I want to first of all, I want to also thank everybody for not going too long. You'll notice I'm not using the clock tonight, and everybody's doing a really great job of keeping their comments short and concise. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please bring in uh, the one speaker who hasn't spoken before? Yes, Mayor, it's Jeff Rose. Jeff, please say your name and address for the record and your comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Commission. Jeff Rose, 8051 Fraud Avenue. Um, this is more for FPNL, and I guess kind of the commission. I know the mayor has been living here, I believe, for more than 15 years, as well as the vice mayor. And I think uh, Commissioner Kessel Velasquez would like to be living here for the next 15 years as well. So I guess where I'm getting at is if, if we pay for it now, in 15 years when it's our turn, we want to get reimbursed or get that credit because it sounds like you're going to be doing it, just not for 15 plus years. And if we pay for it now, we want to, it looks like, to be able to get reimbursed for it because it, we're going to fork it up now, but you're going to fork it up in 15 years. So when that time comes, is there a way that we could get the credit back for the money that we paid now? Thank you. Great, great question. So is is that that's a great question, and I think uh, Mr. Rose put it better than I was trying to put it. And that is, is are those credits that you talked about earlier, those tariffs, those credits, those rebates, are those the reimbursement that we're getting uh, as as a uh, an accommodation for the fact that we're doing it now and we will be getting it for free later? Or would we get something down the road back or will we get nothing back? So under the storm protection plan, there is no credit or reimbursement uh, mechanism. Under the overhead underground conversion programs we mentioned earlier, the tariff has included a credit system or a credit, uh, I guess, line item that will be applied to the project once we go through the detailed cost binding estimate phase, which is the next step for the uh, the project. And Shonda, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. So to, to basically answer your question, um, as Chris just mentioned, the clause recovery is completely separate from the conversion. So the credits associated with the conversion, that line item, that's been that's part of the program and it has been part of the program um, when we started this uh, process back in, as Paul said, uh, 2008 to uh, 2009, 2010. So those credits are not related to the clause. And at this point in time, there is no mechanism for creating a credit associated with the clause. Thank you. Nelly, go ahead. Uh, I'm just, because we've been talking about this and I think we're, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because the only thing that FPL would be changing in any area would be the laterals, correct? The feeders would still be responsibility for each town to pay, correct? 
Yes. So, so the lateral so, under. So under. Oh, go sorry, go ahead, Shonda. So the under the storm protection plan, they would target laterals for potential undergrounding. The feeders we would um, potentially move forward with hardening, which would be um, concrete poles or bigger wood poles. So there's no part of the protection plan that plans to underground feeder. Okay, well, let's, let's for, for so, the, I'm, I'm wait, 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 for so the benefit of our residents, hold on, Nellie. Tell us what feeders are and tell us what laterals are so it's very clear to the residents, please. So our distribution system um, comes out of the substations, the main collectors coming out from the, subs, uh, from the power plants, right? So those substations are placed throughout the community. Out of those substations, we have our main power lines that come out, we call those feeders. And those route through the community normally along uh, main thoroughfares, but sometimes along side streets as well. Out then, I guess, fused off of those main feeder lines are lateral lines. And those are typically the lines that you see that run behind homes or maybe the single line that you see running in front of homes. From there, you'll have the transformer, the silver cylinder that's on the pole, and that's what actually creates the power at a voltage that the house can take. So you have the main feeder lines and then you have the lateral lines. So okay, the main that, feeder... That didn't really help if, me. If, um, that didn't if, help me. If, it's complicated to if, understand. If I, can help, if, if I can help maybe clarify and give an if analogy. It, it like, a, if, a, like a presentation with pictures and everything. If, if you think of main arterial roadways such as Biscayne Boulevard or Collins Avenue, those are main thoroughfares. Those would be something similar to a feeder line, right? And then roads that branch off of those main roadways off of Collins or Biscayne would be something like a lateral. So if you think of the main thoroughfare, it serves many cars, it serves many thousands of customers on our feeder line. And then off of those feeder lines, it branches off into smaller subsets or smaller okay, lines well, that service in neighborhoods. Christopher, we're talking about the residential area. So it sounds to me like what you just said, given that those are on Collins and Harding, that all of the lines in the residential area on the poles right now, those are laterals. You're considering those no. laterals? No, no, he, no he, I was I was just providing uh, I was just providing okay, analogy. Well, let's get real clear. To, let's get real clear. Let's sure. get real clear. What I are the lines? Analogy. Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. What are the lines that go up and down 88th Street that on the poles? What are those called? Okay, so just to back up for a second, I was just providing an analogy to help give a comparison to the road grid network that we use sometimes to help explain the differences between feeders and laterals. I was not saying that along Collins only feeders run. I can't tell you right now off the cusp what line runs along 88th Street. What I can tell you is we did look at and I made an analysis of what uh, type of lines are in Surfside. About 52% of the lines in Surfside are, are feeder lines, 48% are lateral lines. And I mentioned that earlier in my remarks that a little bit more than half of the town is served by feeder. Okay, so that so let and me, a little bit less stop. than half are, are let laterals. Me, let me stop you and just say that 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 means based upon what I think I'm hearing you say is that half the lines will go underground and half the lines will remain above ground. Is that what you're proposing right now? Uh, because that's under, that's under. that that's not acceptable. I'm not I'm not excited about that presentation because what we want in the residential area is we want all that stuff on the ground. No, no, what you sure. think that's so, if we were to pay for it. If we pay for it, it everything it goes under. That's what we're, we're looking at. Yeah. To, so, to clarify, yeah. under the storm protection plan and under the lateral hardening undergrounding program, under that plan, right, the laterals will only be undergrounded at a future date based on the criteria that's approved by the public service. Okay, that, and, and, and that's under the, let me stop you. Let me stop you, Chris, because you, you know, let's take it a piece at a time. So, and, and what you're, what you're saying there is that if we by chance wanted to wait around for 15 or 20 years, FPL would come along and probably put half the stuff underground and leave half the stuff above the ground. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not interested in that. We're interested in putting everything underground so that our, our residential area is beautiful and we don't look at the ugly poles anymore. So I don't think we need to talk about that option where we leave half of the stuff up and put half of the stuff on the ground because that's not what we're interested in. No, the sure. reason why and, we're and, mentioning and, that was because that pertains to Jeff Rose's question about the credit. 
because what, what FPL is offering is only offering those lateral lines 10, 20 years from now. Correct. They're Correct. not offering to, to, to do everything that we won't see any lines anywhere. So that's the thing that I wanted to make sure that we understand that there's a difference between what they're offering 20, 30 years from now than what we are trying to. Uh, that's a um, great point. That's a great right. point. That's a great point. So, so what they're that's offering. That's important that we understand that. What, and what, the credit that they're giving us right now is 20, what, what um, Paul was talking about is 20%, 25, approximately 25% of what it would cost to underground the power lines, which is their cost of that um, hardening, which is putting those concrete poles it's, on. It's, it's based on our tariff. What, what the PSC has approved under the credit system for the overhead to underground conversion. So just to clarify as well, what we've been working with the town on since I believe it was March or April of last year is through the overhead underground conversion program to uh, provide a ballpark estimate for what the town wants to do, right? Which based on what I'm hearing, what we were communicated with last year was to underground feeder lines and lateral lines within the town limits. And so that's what that ballpark estimate is based on. That's what the next uh, stage in the process would be for us to go through a design phase and develop okay. a cost okay. binding that's, estimate that's, to provide you. That's good enough. That's good enough. Thank you. Okay, I Madam. I hope Clark. we all understood that now. Yeah. No. No. That's that. That. It, yeah. It's really. It's been very a little confusing. I should say. Listen. Go ahead, Tina, and then I'm going to get the speakers, and then we're going to move on. Okay. Yeah. I, I just wanted to um, go back to uh, FPL and ask the question. Uh, Chris had stated that uh, once the undergrounding system is complete. FPL owns the system, and um, I'm just wondering how do, how do we recoup uh, our, our credits? Like, uh, you know, I'm just wondering how does that work? So we build the system, uh, but it's your your equipment, and you own it. And where does that leave us once it's done? For the overhead to underground conversion, when we calculate the cost, there's a cost to do installation of underground. There's a cost to remove the overhead. Um, as Paul mentioned, there's a uh, depreciated value that you get a credit for for the for the um, removal of or the 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 facilities that are there. We also have a credit associated with the um, uh, with the if we were to build the system today at today's standard. So there's credits that are in it, and those credits are applied in the initial um, before the project begins. So for the overhead underground conversion, those credits will be applied on the front end. So whatever you pay will be the balance after the so, credit. So to answer your question, Tina, I think what I'm hearing is that our credit will be in the form of a reduced price at the outset. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Does that answer your anything else, Tina? Uh, no, that's all for now. Thanks. Thank you. Charles. Just a final question for me. Then what does it take to move this to have a real plan that's not just ballpark figures? Okay, I the think next. that that's that's what we're doing with Mr. Abbott and FPL, correct? And all the other yeah. utilities. We are getting the binding cost estimate. We're paying the fee for the engineering to FPL right now, and the other utilities who will do their designs. We will incorporate those into a common set of plans, and then we will have a full and complete cost estimate what the project will be within several months. I, I won't tell you how soon, but but within months, not years. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Um, Sean, do you, you want to clarify? I'm oh, sorry. Hold on a I second, Mr. Christopher. Hold on a second. Go ahead, Nellie. Well, I just, I, the purpose of this was definitely to make sure that everybody understood that we're not getting anything for free. Um, we will be paying for um, our entire project and we're going to get credits but it's not free and it's not gonna be free ever. Um, well, I, and I think thing. more than that, if we were gonna get anything that we didn't have to pay for, number one, we'd have to wait for a decade, I think I heard. And number more two, half of the town would not be left, half of the town would be left above ground. Okay, all right, listen, Madam Clerk, please bring in the first speaker. First speaker will be Deborah Simadavilla. Debbie, please do your name and address for the record and your comments. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, thank you for this wonderful meeting of minds. I'm so happy to hear that we're getting uh, clarification. 
because as um, Commissioner Velasquez said, at the last meeting, Senator Pizzo stated information that was not, obviously it's not, um, it was not correct. And I posted something on Nextdoor and a certain resident started putting information out there that just caused more havoc and confusion. Um, and as I stated on that post, we need to get all the facts. So I'm very thankful that you guys are laying on the table all the facts. Now, from what I'm listening to, you guys have come to the clarification that it was very helpful that that's, by the way, it's very confusing for most people out there because they hear different terms, storm protection plan, lateral program, pardoning program. I've been trying to check this out for many years and I realize that it's all the same thing. And at the end of the day, what I want every resident to understand, as was stated earlier, that that particular plan that Mr. Pizzo was talking about means that only, as Chris said, I think 48% of the poles would get uh, underground. Otherwise, yeah. it would be left with concrete poles. So that's okay. clear, right? Now, yep. yeah. now the old, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you, I'm, I'm going to go. We're going to we're trying to keep it to one minute. So I okay. mean, can, can you conclude? Okay, let me be quick. Yes, conclude. I want to know. I want to make sure, Mr. Paul Abbott, that you give us that you give us a price for the direct boring because that would prevent the huge trenches. I don't know. A, a question for you: Are you giving us the price for direct boring and the trench? Um, the other question that I have is. Uh, do, 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 do. You guys answered everything else. The FEMA hazard mitigation grant, like uh, North Bay Village, uh, was uh, awarded. Are we going after that? And if not, what you know? What's the status on the grants? Um, I just thank you very let's, much. Okay, Everybody let's see if we can get the answers to those questions, Mr. Abbott. Uh, what about the uh, direct the, uh, boring? The direct boring. The project will incorporate every feasible method known to man there will be directional boring there will be open trench there will be every conceivable way to minimize the disruption to the community as the conduit system is installed and what about the fema grants using the fema grants jason go ahead thank you mayor vice mayor and, and commission yeah, I can just speak just uh, shortly on that. Uh, two aspects is one, the, the town did submit uh, through the, the state's uh, Department of uh, Economic Opportunity or DEO uh, grant application for $9 million towards this project. And we'll hopefully hear back in the next uh, couple of months at the latest. Uh, the FEMA program in which um, Debbie was speaking of, I did speak with a consultant that actually helped North Bay Village attain that program. And FEMA made a, a change to that grant uh, program and uh, undergrounding the utilities is no longer an eligible um, activity as part of that FEMA, FEMA grant. So we're, we're still looking for any other opportunities and we're hopeful on the one through the state. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nelly. Question I have for Jason. So you're saying that you only spoke to someone in North Bay Village about the FEMA grant, not to FEMA itself. Uh, yes, I didn't speak uh, to FEMA. I spoke to the uh, consulting firm that does uh, grants and that works for North Bay Village um, to see if we could apply for that as we spoke many months ago about that and that uh, per them and their, their work, and we've been, I've been speaking to them a couple different times, that that grant uh, program through FEMA uh, is no longer eligible for this activity. Thank you. Well, maybe there's another program. Yeah, yeah. I think we should contact FEMA ourselves and figure out what's going on. Well, I, I, that's a great idea. And I, I maybe uh, Mr. Manager uh, and Jason, you guys can uh, reach out and, uh, you know, find out if there is another opportunity with FEMA to, uh, to get some money for the town of Surfside to do the underground. Okay, let's uh, bring in, I see there's one more speaker. Go ahead, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor Joshua Epstein. Please say your name and address for the record and your comments. Joshua Epstein, 9317 Bay Drive. I had a couple quick comments and then also some questions. In terms of, I know Jason Pizzo brought up lobbying. I know in this day and age, you can pretty much get anything done with money and lobbying, and that'll cost one-tenth of the price. So I guess to Mr. Abbott, have you seen projects done before that have been moved up through lobbying? Another thing was, how much could we get an estimate and how much would it cost 
to only have those feeder mm -hmm. lines underground in now, and then those lateral lines are going to be done for free in 15 to 20 years, or even earlier than that, if we can get um, through lobbying. Because I think what we're missing out is those feeder lines are the, what's the main, what's ugly. Those are the, those are the zigzag lines going from house to house. There's going to be poles there anyways. We're not having floating lanterns in Surfside. There's going to be those light poles there. So if we can have light poles that also have those lateral lines on it and save our town, I don't know, $10 million by doing that, we can use that $10 million for parks, brand new pieces of land. I think everyone's for undergrounding the power lines. It's just a matter of allocation of funds. And that's what we have to look into. So those are, those are my two questions. And if we could possibly get an estimate um, regarding just undergrounding those feeder lines and then lobbying's impact on this and if that would be a good route to take. Thank you. Okay. Uh, final comments, anybody, before we move on? Okay. Uh, Christopher, thank you. Ray, thank you. Um, Chandra, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate all the information. And uh, hopefully we can, and Mr. Abbott, thank you very much for uh, representing the town and uh, making sure that we get the best deal that we can get. I know you're working hard to do that. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Does someone want to move that? Make a motion to move that forward, Tina? Okay. I was muted. Wait, um, I had some corrections to the minutes that was uh, sent to everyone through the clerk. Um, okay. So I, well, I can move the... Then, then I, I suggest you pull them um, so that we can, we can go through them individually just to make sure it's okay rather than go line by line right now. Which okay, which minutes did you? For everyone to, to review. So which, um, which? Yeah, Mayor, yeah. we circulated them yesterday. Actually, I'm sorry. We circulated them with the members of the commission yesterday with highlights of the changes. I I I okay. I didn't see them. So okay. Um, let's let's if it's okay with you, Tina. Let's put it on for next month, and I'll take a look at it, and everybody can have a look at it, and then we can approve it with next month's. Uh, Agenda. It, what? Which minutes are they? Uh, it was a couple of them. Uh, you know, it was just a, a couple of words here and there. And but it's all right. Which minutes were they? Oh, well, I, let me look at the email I sent because I offhand I don't know. Because we've got we've got one, two, three, four, five, yeah, six it, days. I mean, it was several of them. Uh, let me see. All right. Well, listen. It doesn't matter. We can there put it on for next month. I'm not. There were amendments done to each one of them. It oh, was the, the zoning code workshop of February 4th. All right, thank you. Regular then, then let's then okay, Tino, you don't have to list them all. Let's go. Oh, let's yes, pull, so that's why I was going through. Let, let's say. pull let's pull them all cuz you said they're all they're all edited. Not all of them. I don't think so. It's, well, I just yeah. heard I just heard the clerk say yes, they're all edited. It was Okay, there's three edited. Two of them. It was the February 4th, the February 9th, and the February 18th. Right, it's those three. Okay, well then, you know, that's 75% of them. So well, let's... I, I mean, I did it ahead of time so that, you know, I sent it through the clerk uh, first thing Monday morning. So well, Tina, I, that's fine. That's fine. But I didn't get to see it. So I, I don't want to... I can't vote on it if I didn't see it. So... Is there any objection to putting it on with the next meeting? No, not at all. Not at all. Okay, so let's move that to the next meeting. What else is on the consent agenda, uh, Sandra? The, just the town manager reports and attorney report, the boards and committee reports, and the limousine of South Florida. All right. Does someone want to move that? Yes, I'll motion okay. to move that forward. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Second. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Commissioner Castle? Yes. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. Vice Mayor Paul? Reluctantly, yes, because it's a lot of work for the clerk to have to read, put that in there again. It's a lot of pages of paper. But, uh, you know, I'll well, say yes. Actually, it doesn't have to be in there again. All we need, I just need the uh, the package that that was sent to review. Yeah, so we need to add it to the next agenda, Mayor. Yeah. The clerk is not even complaining. Yeah, I don't think I don't see it as a big deal, Tina. All right. So, okay. how are you voting? Reluctantly, yes. how? No, I said reluctantly, reluctantly yes. yes. Reluctantly, yes. Okay. Go okay. ahead. Uh, reluctantly, yes. Mayor, the working carries. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. 
The next, uh, I think we're up to resolutions 5A, uh, community digital sign authorization to expand. Would you take us through that, Sandra? Yeah. Resolution of the Town Commission of the Town of Surfside, Florida, approving Don Bell Sign LLC for the installation and maintenance of two community digital signs. Finding that the work is exempt from competitive bidding pursuant to section 3-137F of the town code as public works purchase for town facilities. Authorizing the town manager to enter into a necessary agreement for such work, providing for implementation and providing for an effective day, item 5A. Thank you. Is there a motion to move that forward? I'd like to make a motion to move that forward. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Tina. Discussion. Who would like to go first? I'll just Charles, how do you hit this first? If you, you, don't you hit mind. the buzzer first. Go ahead. Um, it's, um, you know, it's a shame that there was, that this wasn't bid competitively, um, but why I can't support this is that this is not like a sustainable um, or remotely resilient approach to our digital signage. Um, there are many sign vendors who can meet the criteria of actually getting the sign. But to me, the most important thing is how the software integrates to make it resilient and sustainable and flexible when used under COVID, under an emergency, or just for everyday use. And there are many even freeware and shareware solutions in the digital signage world, um, even using something like Google uh, Chromecast to push to our signs. Um, digital signage is very prolific at um, you know, everything from restaurants in the private sector to certainly the, uh, the public sector as well. And this particular solution is, um, is a, a retro type of interface where whoever needs to update the sign has to go to the sign and program it like, like a TV. Um, and that's the only way to get the media on there. And I don't support that at all. Um, it goes against kind of everything that I talk about. I think they should research more better solutions. Okay, Charles. Fits into Thanks. messaging for, uh, you know, for the town. Thank you very much. Anybody else uh, want to comment? Yes, Vice Mayor. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Kessel, for that. I wasn't uh, I wasn't seeing it that way, but you raise interesting points. Um, you know, the last time I was in New York, I saw a lot of digital signs everywhere. I mean, they even had them in the subways. So I thought, oh, this is cool. And um, actually, when this came up on the commission in 2020, I was concerned what kind of signs we were going to get. You know, we had approved uh, we approved a lower amount on that budget, but. Um, you know, I thought it was the kind of signs we have now, and I, I wasn't in favor of that because it's just not the right look. So I'm, I'm kind of good with the look. I'm just wondering what kind of sustainable signs are out there. You know, I, I would reconsider if, if there are some that we could consider, you know, aside from these, but these are the current practice, you know, in, in other cities. Okay, uh, Nelly. Um, I think this looks great. I think it, I mean, it's really, it's not us who are going to go up to the machine and change the sign. So really that's an irrelevant point, I think. Um, it is our staff that's going to do that. Um, we're going to have one at the community center, one by the, um, by the um, Publix. I think it's going to look beautiful. I mean, what I see here in the, in the pictures that were provided for us uh, of what it's going to look like, I think, I, I don't understand what you mean by sustainability of, I'm not quite sure what that means in terms of a sign uh, that's information for our residents regarding COVID, regarding vaccinations, regarding events that were taking place in town, um, regarding any kind of information that we want to put out there for our residents. Example, we used to have to make those um, plastic um, uh, banners and stick them on the um, on the palm trees, which would hurt the palm trees. So in all reality, I think this is sustainable in the sense that, or in resilient in the sense that we're not using our palm trees anymore. We would be having it, this installed in the proper manner, in a professional manner, um, whether it's someone that has to go up to the machine hand with a handheld computer and change it or not. I mean, that really is irrelevant to me. I don't think that that's a deal breaker. Um, I'm not a software person, so I really don't know. I'm sure that our town manager has engaged in um, professional people that are going to do the right job and and deliver us some beautiful signs. And I'm very excited to see that. Thank you very much. That's all I had to say. Okay. Um, you know, listen, I think it's a brilliant idea. I love it. 
And uh, I think we need some form of uh, signage. I uh, sat with the manager and the assistant manager today and they, they gave me a great uh, presentation. Um, I, I feel good about it. I, I will say, I think it, I think it needs a little more, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to vote for, uh, something like this, but I think it needs a little more. I'd like to see, uh, an elevation, a real elevation of what it would look like. Um, because we just have the sign company that put together a, uh, you know, a very simple sort of elevation. The other, the other issue I want to bring to, uh, everyone's attention is I was advised um, that uh, there are issues with these types of signs in that they become uh, uh, venues for, um, uh, you know, others that want to say something on them. For instance, you know, they, they become potentially where people can say, hey, listen, I want to be able to, you know, say that we have a, uh, a drive for this or that, or we want to use your sign to do this. And uh, there may be some, some open government laws that relate to those signs where we don't have absolute control over what the signs say. And uh, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it was raised to me. And I think it's, it would be worth understanding that because I think that we wouldn't want to move forward on something like that without knowing whether or not we had full control to sort of program what the sign says on a regular basis. Uh, and, and listen, I, I think the placement generally is, is great. I like the idea of having it at the community center. And I also like the idea of having it on that, uh, on that parking lot in that area, because you got a lot of people stopping there at that stoplight, looking at that sign. But I just think it needs a little more work. And if it's okay, and Nelly, listen, I want to commend you for bringing it up. And I know you've been fighting hard to get this done. And uh, I, I just think we need one more month. I think that's what I need. I need an additional 30 days. Can Lily answer that question that you're mentioning? Okay. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I've let's seen get... several cities that have these kind of signs. And I, I've only seen information okay about well let's that. let's do this jason jason had his hand up first and then i'll go to lily go ahead jason uh, uh thanks uh mary I'll, I'll speak to two items and, and lily can chime in so the first is just um on how the sign would be updated software wise i i, I did we did speak with uh, uh commissioner castle and, and i did see some information he sent we did discuss that with the, the vendor and there are uh different software options that could be utilized other than the free in the package one that comes in there and when i uh, do want to assure the commissioner that you know the the um, our IT team along with the communications team will look at all of those options and make sure we're smart and what software we utilize to update it. But it is remotely so, uh, remotely updatable, uh, and an employee could be in Orlando and update the sign remotely. So you know this is something we're talking about evacuations and a hurricane or an emergency situation. We don't have to have someone plugged into it like the VMS boards that the police utilize in in, in town. So that's that item. And on the item about the, the, the messaging, um, I did communicate with um, our town attorney and uh, uh, Tony did reply back because those signs are within a certain um, distance of a, a DOT road, there are certain limitations on that. And so and I'm just gonna read it a little bit here, but it says the signs owned by the municipality uh, may display information regarding governmental services, activities, events, or entertainment. So it must be only governmental. So things that are not allowed are messages that specifically reference any commercial enterprise, messages that reference a commercial sponsor of an event, personal messages, or political campaign messages. And so we are hedged in by that state law, whether we were interested in it or not. Um, they, they must be basically, you know, come to the family fun day, tune into the commission meeting, but it can't be even happy birthday messages or or things along those lines. And, and Lily, I don't if you want to add anything to that, but. Yeah, that's that's correct, Jason. We did look at it. Um, this is a municipal sign, and it should be limited to government or public messaging only. No commercial advertising or private displays of any kind. And as long as you stick to those parameters, it should be fine. I'm not aware of any issues, Mayor. Yeah, that that was the question, and it it came <laughs> from a uh, a uh, someone who runs a, a, a city nearby and it was just that you know just be sure you look into it because uh you know there are 
there are issues that could be that could come up. And like you said, I think it's public use, and I don't know to what extent that means that we maintain full control over what the sign says as a put. You know, and again, I, I don't want to slow walk this item at all, but I do think uh, if we if it was okay with you, Nelly, if we could take another thirty days because to hash it out and get some elevations, uh, I'd like to see what it would look like. But like elevations in what sense? I'm not well, sure. Well, I, I mean, what, what we've about. got is we've, we've got the uh, the sign company taking a picture of the wall and taking that sign and putting it like on top of the wall. I mean, that it, uh, I, I think that it would be, and again, I'm, I'm not quite sure. We, we'd want to know exactly where the position was. Um, and we'd want to, I want a much wider picture, like a realistic to scale where we could definitely, you know, say, okay, well, that's where the sign's going to go and we don't end up with the sign 10 feet over here. And it's more facing the side street rather than the main street. But listen, I think we need to do it. And if we can sort of check the boxes and make sure that we don't lose control, control over the message, that that is a, the biggest concern I have. Well, and and Charles, I'll get you in a second. Just let me finish and, with Ellen. And those details that you're talking about can be... Um, can be tweaked later on. I mean, the point is to get this sign, and I, I, I really would not want to wait any further. Um, especially that Jason has really answered everyone's questions here. I mean, uh, Jason, are these going to be on just like right there on top of the wall? No, they're going to be placed with hurricane impact. Um, Unless I, I assume that Nelly, I, I assume that I, I'll tell you what, more. Of, my concern is I want to see how it really looks in an architectural rendering, you know, because right now we just got the sign guy kind of putting the sign on top of the wall. And I, I'm not sure exactly where on the wall it's going to go. And uh, it, I, I think we just need to take a couple more steps, but go ahead, Charles. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I agree with you that all these things are very important. The timeliness of it, um, having it function, having it look good. And of course the messaging has to be legal and proper and to the point. Um, but, you know, quick research, and I'm, I, I appreciate Jason addressing my concerns because quick research shows show that this is a very kind of common issue where people are facing the same same issues that and concerns that we have, which include security. Um, but also my point about sustainability is the usability, the access, so that whoever is in charge of our communications isn't saddled with yet another technologically challenged system that the town adopted that that isn't useful when the when the when the uh, the tires hit the pavement um, and those issues are very much front and center in terms of the conversation of choosing the best software so the breather would allow Jason to take a look at what the software options are uh, but the notion of a town staff person during COVID or during a storm changing a message in the rain or the flood uh, you know that's like the that's like the era of pong. Sorry to be blunt, but um, you know we're way ahead of this. And as long as it does have um, it does have you know the remote control access, like Jason said, um, you know. But then the next question is, what standards standards is it using? Is it open source, or are we buying into some closed source proprietary software that the town is going to have to be stuck with for generations or as long as the sign lasts? So those that's are that now. that is a, and, and Charles explain that a little further because that means that if we don't pay the this particular vendor forever um that the sign stops working because we might not get software updates or or like or something like that so yeah, yeah right. your point right. your 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 point your point is good listen but I think these Buzzword, guys are open, open source, source is the right direction because it will allow flexibility going forward and integration going forward but I think I think the guys are on it and I I think that uh sounds to me like they've done their homework but I I think that we just need a little more tweaking and uh I think that we should put it on the next agenda at number one okay number one Nelly and that way we can we can nail it at the next meeting. Go ahead. But can you can you kindly ask exactly what you'd like to see on the next agenda? Because well, I, exactly. I mean, if you really, I'm sorry. If you really look at this um, page 142, it gives you the exact location. It tells you how it's going to be put on there. It tells you what materials they're using to put on there. So I'm I'm just a little confused exactly what what what. Well, we're let me just say you're right. The, so if we can make it a clear a clear 
a uh, guidance to the town manager so he knows exactly what to bring back next month. Let me, let me answer your question. I think with respect to the sign at the community center, it's it's easy. That that, that location is on top of the existing sign. So we know where that's going to go and we know how it's going to look. by the Publix. Correct. But the one by the Publix, it, it, it's unclear to me where exactly on the wall it would go. And, you know, I, I, I we need a wider, I, I, see, I see it, I see it. But we need a wider shot than that to show us, you know, exactly how it would look from a distance. Yeah, I see that too, but that's a close-up shot. And the other one is is a very small picture. The first one you said a wider, and the second one is a close. Okay. No, no, but the, the, I'm the, just the, a little confused. Exactly what you're the, what you're asking the, the, me right here. The, the, can can I speak again? Yes, go ahead, Tina. Thank you. Um, so yeah, during the uh, my meeting, my uh, discussion with the manager, I did have a few uh, two reservations. Um, one was kind of minor, but it had to do with the landscaping because on page 142 it mentions removal of the bushes and I just and that's a sustainable issue is that we're removing them but are we putting them back I hope so that we're not just you know so that's one sustainable thing that's minor um the other thing was actually the location uh, the next page on page uh, 143 the location of the sign by the community center um initially when when uh we had previously uh put put out to have signs you know definitely 94th street i have no problem with that location but by the community center i'm, I'm also curious how that's going to look because it seems to me that it's too um set back so that um your only people walking by are going to see it the cars stopped at the light won't necessarily see it because of where it's placed and uh, I, and I think, Mayor, you remember when there was a community sign, it was on the other side of the street by the town hall parking lot. Um, and so I'm just wondering if that's the right location. I'm, I'm well, look, fine with let's, let's, the let's put it this way. It, it's not passing tonight because at the very best, I think we've got uh, a couple that are that have concerns. And, and I think that uh, we might have a couple that would let it go. And I think that an extra month would do us a lot of good. It would let us, you know, look at those issues. I, I'm concerned. I want to get a rendering. I want an architectural firm to do a rendering. And I, you know what? Let's look at the sign at the community center and, and address Tina's concern. Let's. I'm going to drive by it again. I looked at it one time, but I'm going to drive by it again to see if if it's if it's highly visible from the from the cars, and uh, we'll make a decision at the next meeting. So how much money is an architectural rendering going to cost us? Because that's expensive. Well, listen, it is what it is. And I think my guess is $1,000. Okay. Um, and yes, Madam Clerk. Yeah, just for the record, there's actually a motion and a second on the table. So I will need the motion to be withdrawn. Uh, well, I will withdraw it. Okay. All right. So the motion is withdrawn. Um, oh, wait, I have a second. I withdraw the second. Okay. The second is withdrawn. Um, Charles, what sure. are your thoughts? And, uh, and thank you, everybody, for listening. I mean, this, 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 these types of things may be new to you in terms of choosing the, like, the best software. But um, anybody is welcome to go to like digital signage software's software, do a search on any app. And you'll quickly see about the six variables that are important and in play with choosing the right software. Um, and I'm not going to go over them. And I and I know that uh, the town management is very diligent, um, but it obviously has to do with, um, with um, you know, scheduling is a notion, um, and um, as well as security, et cetera. But um, but there's there's a lot of different software options and a lot of discussion out there about best solutions. Okay. Well, you'll have you'll have 30 days. To, uh, to make those recommendations to staff. Um, this will be on the top of the agenda next month and hopefully we can uh, get it done. Okay, let's bring in the last, uh, there's one speaker I see. Joshua Epstein, please take your name and address for the record and your comments. Joshua Epstein, 9317 Bay Drive. I'm gonna be very brief, just about a hurricane impact on this because I know at this point we're kind of expecting a hurricane every year um, this is $50,000, so that's a lot of money to lose in a hurricane. So are we able to take this off in a hurricane? Can it be moved? And then also agreeing with a comment um, Vice Mayor Paul made, I, can, I can't even read the sign in that display at the top. That's from probably 5 to 10 feet away. 
there's not a chance in hell that anyone driving by can see that. Honestly, I can't even read that, and that would be where the sidewalk is. So, and I know the signs right now that we have up there, the plastic signs, I'm not sure, the removable ones, those are higher up. Those are bigger fonts and not as set back, which is why they're visible from the street. So I don't think it's acceptable to spend $50,000 if it can't be seen. Um, and I'd like that those questions actually answered, opposed to the last subject, which I spoke on. You just uh, groomed over my questions and didn't allow anyone to answer them. So that's about it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Epstein, if, if somebody wants to answer your questions, they will answer your questions. I don't control You them. said discussion was over on this topic. We're moving on. Again, I didn't ask you to comment again. Turn the mic off. Um, yes, Madam Clerk. Uh, Mayor, just to confirm, I will need a motion to defer this item. Yes, is there a motion to defer this item to the next uh, agenda at the top? The top will be the top of the resolutions like it is right now. Right. Nellie, do you want to make that motion? Okay, fine. I'll make the motion. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. second the motion. <laughs> okay, thank you. Call the question, please, Madam Clerk. Commissioner Castle? Yes. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. Reluctantly, yes. Vice Mayor Cole? Yes. Mayor yes. Mayor now, I'm not happy though. Now, now wait a minute. Now, how, how did we know you were going to say reluctantly? <laughs> you gave us no hint of that, Nellie. <laughs> Just to confirm, right. Mayor, the motion is to defer this item to a to April 13, 2020, right. 7 p.m. Let's let's get the uh, let let's get the uh, and by the way, I guess the manager has the authority to. Uh, authorize the uh, elevation if uh, if he feels it. Okay, um, would you please take us through 5B, Sandra? Yes. Construction of Lake, Point Lake. A resolution of the Town Commission of the Town of Surfside, Florida, selecting the bid and awarding a contract to David Mancini and Sons, Inc. for construction of the Point Lake and also Becky's Water Main Crossing to Biscaya Island, authorizing the town manager to negotiate and enter into a contract for the work in accordance with the bid and RFP number 2020-03, providing for implementation and providing for an effective date, item 5B. Thank you. Is there a motion to move this forward? Yeah, motion to approve. Okay, is there a second? That. Okay, Nelly, thank you. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, call the question. Mayor, just to confirm who seconded, Commissioner Velasquez did? Okay. <clears throat> yes. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. Yes. Commissioner oh, I'm sorry. sorry. She, she seconded it. Yes. Vice Mayor Paul? Yes. Mayor Burkett? Yes. Mayor motion carries. Okay. Please uh, take us through item 5C. 5C, a resolution of the Town Commission for the Town of Surfside, Florida, approving budget amendment number six to the fiscal year 2020 21 budget, providing for implementation and providing for an effective date, item 5C. Okay. Is there a motion for that? To move forward, motion to move forward. Nelly. Okay, is second. I'll second. Anybody? Okay, Charles. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, call the question, please. Commissioner Velasquez. Uh, yes. Commissioner Castle. Yes. Vice Mayor Paul. Yes. Mayor Burkett. Yes. Mayor, the motion carries. Okay, now we're up to a really good one. Go ahead and read item D, please. A resolution of the Town Commission of the Town of Surf and Florida adopting a civility pledge for elected officials engaged in public discourse, providing for implementation and providing for an effective date in 5D. Okay, is there a motion to move that one forward? Motion to approve. Wow. Okay, is there a second? I'll second it. I would right, like to you. say something. Please. I would like to move this one to next month, being that not all the commission is here and especially the one that disrupts the most is not here. So I think this is something that we should discuss when everyone's here, because this is something that concerns us all. And that is something that is um, that disrupts our meetings, that is disrespectful to our, to our residents. Um, so I honestly think that all our, all our commission needs to be here um, to be able to okay. approve something like this. That, that would have to be... Uh... The motion maker would have to uh, retain that. Reluctantly, yes. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Tina. All right. 
So then what we'll do is, is there a motion to put this at the top of the list for the next meeting? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, that this I think- This is a very important item, I agree. Thank you. Okay, Madam Clerk, you had your hand up? Yeah, I just wanna uh, clarify. So just to clarify, uh, Vice Mayor Paul and Commissioner Kessel will do the original motion and Vice Mayor Paul is making a new motion to defer this item to the April commission meeting. Top, top of the list, right. Second top of the list. Second I, top. I'll of second that. Okay, any discussion on that item? Um, I'll just say real quickly that, you know, I think that this is important. It happened to be something in a memo that I'm preparing um, as, and I, I was preparing as part of the decorum discussion. Um, and, um, and I don't know if waiting on other commissioners is gonna make it expedited because perhaps somebody doesn't show up next, next month as well. Um, that's just my comment. No, we'll okay. figure that well, out next month. <laughs> Sorry. No, to, to add to what Commissioner Kessel said, I mean, we, we can also set the example by passing this tonight. Well, you can always have another one for the next meeting too. Exactly. We can have two. We can have a double resolution. I, but, I honestly think yeah. that the most important thing is to have everyone here because this is a pledge that you want people to behave themselves to respect each other. And honestly, the one that has really embarrassed us the most is really not here. So I think that that needs to, that that, that particular item needs to be um, present. Okay, that well, let's call, let's, situation. we have a motion to defer it. Um, I see there's somebody with their hand up. Go ahead, Madam I'll, Clerk. I'll, I'll um, second Tina's motion to defer. All right. Well, yeah, we have a motion on the table. We're let's let's hear from the audience now. Go ahead. Joshua Epstein, please say your name and address for the record in your <coughs> Joshua Epstein, nine three seventeen page I mean, I'm obviously aware that we're deferring this. Why is the clock set to one minute instead of three minutes? Just out of curiosity. Because we're only giving one minute. That's, I believe it's in the town code for the meeting that well, it has to be three don't argue, minutes. Don't argue, Nelly. Just I mean, that's the rules of the meeting, I believe. As to, to the attorney, it does it not say three minutes in the town code for the meetings? I don't think anyone gets to choose how long they speak for. And I believe it says specifically it's three minutes. So I'd like that question answered. There, can that question be answered? Is that it? Sure, I just want that question answered. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a motion on the on the table. Please call the question, Madam Clerk. We can't hear you, Sandra. Your microphone. Sorry, Commissioner Velasquez. Yes. Commissioner Castle. Uh, yes. Vice Mayor Paul. Yes. Mayor Burkett. Yes. Mayor motion carries. Thank you. Uh, we're up to item E. Would you please take us through that, Sandra? Yes, Mayor. Resolution of the Town Commission of the Town of Surfside, Florida, urging Governor DeSantis to increase COVID-19 vaccine allocations to Miami-Dade County in order for the town and other local governments in Miami-Dade County to meet vaccine demands among vulnerable community members, providing for transmittal and providing for an effective date on 5E. Okay, thank you. But before we go any further, we have Senator Pizzo on the line, and I just wanted to see if he wanted to say hello and and, and give us an update on anything that might be happening at the state level. Can you bring Senator Pizzo in please, uh, Jose? Hi everybody. Hi, Hi how are you? Hi. Good, long day here in Tallahassee. Um, I just wanted to, and I committed to, to come back today, um, some, th some good news and some, you know, some expected news. The governor has announced a billion dollar resiliency plan. So I, as I've been encouraging other cities and Mayor Cava who came up to visit this past week, it's really important to try to get on board uh, with each other in a regional and individual format to find out what our proportionate share would be. It is directed entirely towards calls of resiliency, but it's really for infrastructure. So hint, hint, these are things that obviously that are of paramount importance to us more so than, than other inland communities. Um, and the DEP is also um, available and accessible on, on that level. Uh, in short order, we have the Airbnb bill coming up. It is gonna be in a committee that I sit on uh, two days from now. Uh, we, we've made some amendments and some headway on trying to uh, curtail a lot of the preemption that, that comes along with it. And um, I see that you have a resolution pending as it relates to, to COVID vaccine and availability. Not exactly the most efficient uh, rollout uh, and things are, you know, kind of all over the place.
misplaced and a lot of misinformation, but uh, I urge anybody that's in a situation that believes that they have an emergent situation or they're vulnerable to please reach out. We, we have had no problem whatsoever uh, getting people vaccinated that qualify under whatever the moving target is. Um, and, and I haven't been vaccinated yet. I'm not opposed to it. We've done PSAs for people to be vaccinated. But if you have people that are homebound, we can get we can get them vaccinated. If you have people that are uh, that have issues and then need any information, even on, on variants, but uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, we're in Senator, the what about the infrastructure? We, you know, we're trying to get our houses lifted up so they're out of flood danger, and we're, we're, we've got. I've actually got one resident who's ready to go, and I know that there's many, many more behind him. Um, is there a way we could get some funding to do that in Surfside? So the, the the importance of the announcement of the governor's funding, and then of course what we're requesting at the state level, is to triage priorities. I will tell you that the most emergent circumstance is a rip up, repair, and replacement of sanitary sewer concurrent with getting off of septic. Now that doesn't apply to Surfside. I know that's not happy news, but you saw the recent fish kill we had in Biscayne Bay. We have a really dire situation. It's it's not really public yet, but I don't mind telling you anecdotally, the former water and sewer director for Miami, uh, for the Miami-Dade County bought a house himself in my district. And when he went for a, a septic inspection, I'm told, the guy came back and said, sir, there's not a septic tank in your backyard. So right now it's, it's, uh, it's a septic, it's a nutrient levels and all that. However, like we talked about with FPL, uh, I want to connect your city manager, clerks and attorneys with, with DEP because they're going to have their own sort of triage of issues of what they find to be to be important. If there is more available available matching federal dollars or, or state dollars as it relates, uh, you know, to, to lifting homes, to lifting transformers, to undergrounding, uh, then and that's where the money is available. And there's no money for something else. Well, I would say let's not, you know, let's be mindful to go ahead and take what we can possibly get. What I did, I sent um, Sandra the clerk a link to the October 2019. I didn't realize it was that long ago when, that I promised to you guys last time. So she'll distribute it for you to see that meeting we had in North Bay Village to see what everyone's responsibilities and roles are as it relates to utilities, whether it's FPL, AT&T, Comcast, the whole thing. It'll spare you having, I think, to having to have an extra meeting on the same topic if you all individually watch it. And it'll sort of give you a little bit of a head start for when you do have a meeting with utilities or, or raise the issues to know which questions to ask. You can watch it in the convenience of your home, smartphone, whatever, but it's an important meeting to watch because we went over the exact same issues and topics, you know, know whose role and responsibility on laying conduit on spacing on, you know, who has control. So are you going to, you're going to send a link to that, that recording of the meeting to all of us? I sent it, I sent it to Sandra already and I'm sure, I think Sandra, you have it already, right? Okay, great. I'll okay. look forward to seeing that, Senator. And, and, and we'll send it. Again, I, I just want to be, there's a whole basket of resiliency and what I call it survival issues, whether it's raising your home, undergrounding electric, septic over on the west side of the mainland area, repairing and ripping up and replacing drainage projects, whatever dollars and resources are available, let's take advantage of. Okay. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's basically the position, but I'm available, you know, for right. any questions and always. Anybody else reason. have a question for the Senator? Yes, Tina. Happy yeah. birthday, Vice oh. Mayor. Ah, thank you, Jason. I just wanted to mention, just to tap on the infrastructure, we, we were thinking with, also with the undergrounding and the drainage, because we have the Abbott Avenue drainage project that we're about to uh, start. So it would be great if we could get funding for that. And then also I wanted to ask you about um, SB 226. I just read about that yesterday. Uh, how's that going? That's the home-based businesses. So uh, 226 is going to be one of those things where I try to state and, and argue for great particularity about wh where it could be a bit of an overreach and it could be abused, I think, at, at certain levels. There's different arguments. I'm happy to talk about with that individually or if you guys have questions on it or what your concerns are. I have my own. Um, I also have concerns with SB 522, which you guys should, should closely watch. That's the Airbnb bill. Oh, yeah. On the funding aspect, you guys have a great match. You know, I think you're asking for, so there's 600, you're providing matching 400 or 400 matching 600. I had like 72 that we submitted. Um, but that's a really good matching situation. I mean, as far as we have some cities that submit something that say we're not putting in a dollar. Well, it doesn't really show a local commitment. Uh, and, you know, the county sometimes is guilty of the, of the same thing. They've asked me to submit something for $66 million uh, for the West Little River District area to do septic to sewer conversion. So, 
this 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 is sort of the Goldilocks period. I know everyone's cried foul about you know there's a dearth of uh, we're in a two billion dollar plus shortfall, but really doc stamps have been you know you've seen home sales they've been off the charts. So our documentary stamp revenue has been huge for the state of Florida, which supports the Sadowski Trust Fund. They're already seeking to, to take money for other things and to put it back in unemployment. Uh, sales tax actually revenue is, is pretty good. We are bouncing back in a V-shaped, a V-shaped kind of recovery. So the doom and gloom is convenient for people to use as leverage to tell you that there's no available dollars. It's really just going to come a question down to how they triage it. So we've already started to get, we get these little notes from uh, chairs of appropriations committee. And this one came out today. It relates to criminal justice and appropriations, nothing exciting for Surfside. Uh, but I'll get the same thing from agriculture for uh, on water projects as it relates to storm and, and, and sanitary. But the Goldilocks period that I'm talking about is everybody's going to be up for election or running for something else. And so uh, hot button, obviously, it's a buzz term to say, you know, sustainability, sustainability, resiliency, infrastructure, all of these things. So it's the time to take advantage to get commitments out of people for doing it. You know, let's be shameless and let's just take what, what, what's what been announced and offered. Got it. Anybody else uh, for the senator? Charles? Hello, Senator Pizzo. Um, so is there any, um, any thinking to tap the feds and the EPA for solving some of these water quality and safety issues that are so paramount? I agree. Yeah, I, you should not expect, you know, I. the thing that I hate the most is whenever you see an elected official with their face on some poster giving away something as if like they paid for it, right? Um, there's a little bit of this at every level. So when, when certain amounts or resources are announced, very often it comes with federal matches or it's actually federal dollars being distributed, right? Over in the city of Miami, they're all giving out Publix gift cards as if like they, they went in their pocket to do it. So Charles, you and I are in a unique situation. When we did the farm share, it was actually money out of my pocket. It's a little different. Um, but yeah, we should absolutely expect federal dollars, you know, you know, as part of it or supplementing the small community wastewater treatment program through the DEP, for instance, pays 80%. The city pays 20%, 50 basis points over 20 years. That's Those are federal dollars. It's just being dispersed. When you get FEMA money, it's being dispersed by the Department of Emergency Management at the state level. So yeah, they're conduits and it really is EPA and matching dollars. Do I think there might be more? Yeah. Do I think there were probably in a situation where we have on a, on a national level, people more receptive to environmental issues? Yes. You got to sell it as a survival. And what I mean by that is you guys have condos where the average sale price is $14 million, but guess what? They're still flushing their toilet into a 60 year old pipe that's broken at some point before it gets to the treatment facility. It's the arteries and guts of our of, of our bodies, so to speak, of the of the subterranean section that really needs repair. Forget how cosmetically beautiful a lot of sections are. Senator, you said you said something about the uh, the uh, septic tanks in the bay. Is 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 it an issue in Biscayne Bay? With that, is that creating an yes. issue? A is, very is big it, issue. So the, I have. Would you probably, would you would you recommend we don't go water skiing for the near future? Um. No, I I mean it, it it sort of comes and goes with with certain sections. You know, I used to be off of Mall Lake in North Miami Beach and I will tell you that there were times when it was toxic. And then there were other times where all of a sudden it was clear, you know, it was the, the ebb and flow. You know, there's a lot of sand that's going to be pulled, millions of cubic yards being taken from the sandbar over at the Hallover area that's going to allow for a different distribution. But let me tell you what the real issue is. Is it's 2021 and the entire cities of Miami Shores, all of Biscayne Park all of El Portal, 1,255 home and businesses in North Miami Beach are on septic. And you know, Miami Shores, you know, and large sections is on the water. And if you don't have a septic tank in your yard when you're flushing your toilet, the effluence is basically just going right back out there. And so we do, we have 101,000 septic tanks in Miami-Dade County and a large concentration of which are in the general area that, you know, not great. Boy, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think you ought to focus on getting that fixed for sure. Very good. Okay, uh, Senator, thank you for coming and we appreciate as as usual your comments. Nellie, smile. There we go. <laughs> I'm smiling. No, I was just listening to everything you said. It was very go. interesting. Thank you very much for coming. Tina, I'll talk to you about 226, a couple of the, the always look for bill analysis. I'll send it to you. 
Yeah, I'd thank like you. to hear about that 226 as well. That's I was reading about that. It's a little concerning. You don't want to have conversion therapy clinics inside of people's homes? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you. Sandra, uh, did you uh, did you uh, read E? I read it, Mayor, but maybe we should pause. Good and welfare. Oh, yeah. Good. All right. Good and welfare. Okay. Well, let's do that. Um, please uh, move the clock to uh, three minutes. And uh, go ahead and introduce the first speaker, please. Uh, first speaker will be Jeff Rose. Jeff, please state your name and address to the record and your comment. Good evening, everybody. Again, Jeff Rose, 8851 Frat Avenue. Um, I think the questions for the commission, but a little bit more for the town attorney. We talked about it at the Parks and Rec, uh, the new park, about the payback of the seawalls, if a portion of that could be paid back potentially for a kayak launch. Um, so I guess the question is, it's much cheaper, obviously, to pay back on the seawalls that we own than to buy a new property. So I just want to know if there was any update on the potential payback of a partial, or let's just say one or two of the seawalls that we could then put a kayak uh, paddleboard launch on, or if it's an all or nothing type of thing. So I guess the question is for the commission or the town attorney. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker, it's Nicole Loper. Nicole, please say your name and address for the record and your comments. Yes, hi, this is actually uh, Nicole's husband, Tim Loper, 8843 Carlisle Avenue. Uh, Jeff Rose actually took my very first question, which was, uh, is there any update from the town attorney on how much it might cost to buy back a portion of the seawall for a kayak launch? Um, I had a follow-up question. Nelly had asked at one point, no, I'm sorry, Commissioner Velasquez had, had asked at one point, um, for the town manager to look at uh, the feasibility of certain parcels of land and, and whether or not we could do something there. And I was curious if the town manager had an update there. Um, that Those are my two issues on the kayak launch. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about was speeding, which I think continues to be an issue in our community. And there was an 11-year-old recently killed in Sunny Isles Beach mm -hmm. at a very busy intersection uh, which I think heightens the importance of this issue to us. Uh, there were recently signs placed in the middle of Harding at 89th and Harding, and that's a, an intersection I use all the time. Those signs have drastically reduced the speed of cars at that intersection, and I, I just think it was a great development. Uh, so I'd like to see if we could maybe expand that program to other areas of the community that are, are, are uh, seeing speeding. Um, there's a slow streets program that Miami has rolled out that might be a good template uh, for that. And the Miami Herald's had a number of articles about it. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was the, the tennis center. Uh, there was an accident at the corner of 88th and Harding maybe two weeks ago where a Range Rover ran into a concrete electric pole. And uh, I go by there all the time and the pole is, is kind of bent over. I don't really know where to go to, to report that to FPL or something like that, but it doesn't look great. Uh, maybe it's safe, maybe it's not. I just don't know if anybody's looked at it. Um, and then uh, also on the tennis where, center. Where, where is that sign, Mr. Loper? It's 88th and Harding? So the signs that actually slow the traffic down are, are yeah. 89th. No, the one, the one that's hit. The electrical pole that was hit is at the corner of 88th and Harding. Okay. Right at Randy, Rand, Randy will make a call on that as soon as possible. Excellent, I appreciate that, that's fantastic. Um, uh, oh, so, so the last thing about the tennis center is, you know, right now because of COVID, we're using a reservation system that's online, uh, that, that seems to work well, but one issue is that it allows non-Surfside residents to make reservations, including coaches. And it would be nice if there were a way to make sure that, res that re reservations are limited to Surfside residents. Uh, because there are multiple times on the weekends, especially now with the, the snowbirds uh, coming down where the mornings on the weekends are booked and it's just, they're not residents. So that's a little frustrating, but uh, appreciate everybody's service and commitment to the community. Thank you. Very good. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Marianne Mashad. Marianne, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Uh, Marianne, your microphone is muted. We'll see if I can. There, now you're Hello. There we go. There we go. 
Hi, Mary and my shy 9225 Collins Avenue. And I, I just wanted to talk about the signage at the beach and entrances. I walk the beach path, Surfside beach path every day. And I just wanna comment on a recent experiences and I send pictures to each of you. So on, on email um, to, uh, so you have visuals. But um, recently on Sunday on 88th Street, I'm walking north and two women with a dog on a leash with their beach chairs go walking past me, past all the signs and just plop themselves down with their dog and, you know, go on merrily with their day. But what I want to say is that um, the signs are attractive, but are not, but are incoherent and too much information to process and due to multiple signs are ignored. I'm not suggesting to replace the signs, but when the time comes, the next round should be done with more thoughtfulness to promote compliance. Right now, they do nothing but clutter the crossings. There are five signs at the entrances and the signs do not support compliance with the rules. Um, what are we saying? We should be more concise and to the point. I mean, what are our main concerns? We are making people oblivious to our rules with five signs at each entrance. We do not, we, we just need one sign. I mean, um, no dogs on the beach, no littering, no alcohol. Um, one sign, surf sign walking path has eight rules. The beach rules have nine rules and the public beach information sign has 10 rules. So what are people gonna read? It, it's just too much. And, and last but not least, the one-way signs on the Surfside walking path are located in the middle of the beach path. So anyone entering on the beach, on, on an entrance path will not see which way to go. So um, I just wanna say that um, I would like to see a more concise and more appropriate way to address signage so that we can get rules adhered to, at least the more, most important rules. And so um, thank you. Marianne, excellent Thank points. Thank you. All yes. excellent points. Thank you. That needs to be looked at. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mr. Manager, I maybe you can uh, you can take a look at that and come back with some recommendations. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Um, yeah, I just uh, I've been speaking with the manager about that. Um, I, about this very specific about the signs, about how people just pass right by. It's Every, everything Marianne said, we've been talking about it. I've asked the manager to do a sign specifically about the dogs. Um, that's just more clear. They, you know, visuals, sometimes I'm a visual person. Sometimes people are visuals. And if the visuals are there, you can just have the visual. It doesn't have to even be written. It's just, you know. Uh, so um, I think the manager is working on it. We, he've sent me some things. So we are definitely on that. Um, I would like to know from the previous speaker, though, uh, about non-residents using the tennis court. I'm not aware. Okay, let's of let's address. I, I've got these all written down, so we'll okay. address that yeah. at the end. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Joshua Epstein. Joshua, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Joshua Epstein, nine through seventeen Bay Drive. I'll be as brief as my with my comments as I can and get to the point. I think we ought to get rid of the commission. I call it the lies and disinformation section in our town gazette. It serves absolutely no purpose. It month after month is used to use taxpayer dollars to spread disinformation to residents who for no fault of their own are not informed about what is going on in our town. So they are fed lies and then we throw up our hands when they come back to us and say, what is going on? Our town gazette taxpayer money should not be used to fund what looks like a Russian disinformation campaign. If this commission does not feel that it is your authority to limit what gets put into the Gazette based on truth, then it's not going to be a success. That ought to not be in there. There's a reason past commissions took that back. If any individual commissioner or mayor wants to set out mass mailers to the residents, they have every 
right to do so, but not using taxpayer money, not with the town seal on it, and not with the trustworthiness of this town at stake. If residents read this Gazette and have to fact check what is in it, how are other towns supposed to rely on us? All of our trustworthiness, anything, any trust that is in, that was instowed in our, into our town is now gone. By the time any of you are out of office, new people are in office, it'll be beyond repair. We will be known as that town with that kooky mayor and just that lying commission with nothing being trustworthy. It's not a canceling of one person. It's the canceling of the entire commission. You're either in this together, you're in this together. I mean, like they tell you in pre-K, you're either in it or you're, you either survive or you don't. And for one person to spread disinformation, uh, disclaimer at the bottom is nowhere near enough. I can't libel, spread libel about someone and then put a disclaimer at the bottom. But if you don't feel that it is your authority to mandate what is put onto that town gazette based on truth, then it ought to not be there. Because ta- it's better that um, taxpayer money is not used for anything than to be used for misinformation in the town gazette, which month after month is what it is used for. In terms of something I brought up next month and I'm working on something and I will hopefully get that onto the next commission meeting. I'll talk to some of the commissioners about it. Our town, just so you know, for the Parks and Rec Department, the minimum starting wage is $11.22. The nonpartisan board of in Miami-Dade County established the living wage in 2020 to be $17.45 in Miami-Dade County. That's $6 under that. In 2008 to 2009, it was $12.95, which means that we're not even paying a livable wage, a starting livable wage, in 2008 or 9. It ought to be raised to that $17.45 per hour, which is what Miami Beach is paying. And this is not about the scope of the work. This is about ensuring that the people that work for our town can live based on the salary that they're given and that they are able to not have to worry about where they're getting their next meal from and they can put food on the table for their children because a livable wage is not a wage that somebody's going to get rich off of. It's a wage where they'll be able to put food on their table and pay their rent. And that's not something that's a negotiable. That's a human right. And that's something that Surfside should make sure happens. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is George Kusulas. George, please state your name and address for the record and your comment. Uh, George Kusulas, 9225 Collins Avenue. Um, Excuse me a second. Um, So uh, the earlier speaker made a great comment about the signage. Uh, As an architect for very large buildings, uh, convention centers, hospitals, things like that, uh, signage is is an art. It's not something, uh, it's not a magazine page. It's not a book. It's not a a card. It's not any of those things. And the signs that are out there are actually quite attractive when you look at them. I mean, they're laid out nicely and all that, but the information, there is just way too much information, too many signs. It's redundant. Um, you, you got to pare it down. So when this, when you look into it, really think very thoughtfully about how you, you, you communicate the information that needs to happen and always do less, not more. There's always the urge in, in any body that looks to, to signage to, to keep on adding. Uh, it happens, and I've done, you know, where the signage packet for, for convention center that I did cost, was a $2 million item just on its own. I mean, for signage, uh, you can see where it can really get out of hand. Um, so this isn't that, obviously, but the, the impulse to do too much on a sign is always there and you have to really, really edit. And so I thought the earlier comments were great. Uh, I've seen some of those signs myself and it's it's a traffic jam of information. It's it's uh, no, it, it's very clear why people walk right past them and do whatever they feel like they can do. Thank you. Thank you, George. And you're right. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Stephen Schatz. Stephen, please say your name and address for the record and your comments. Yes, Stephen Schott, 9101 Collins Avenue. First of all, I want to thank you all, Mr. Mayor and commissioners, for all that you do. Uh, I want to say I've listened to most of the meetings over the past year, and how refreshing to hear civil, congenial, and professional commission meetings as there is this evening. Uh, Simply, I just want to say that I want to support the closing of those street ends again of Byron and Bay and underscore what was said earlier about having children, the safety for children, being a father of two, five, and a seven-year-old, you know, the walkability and the children's safe, safety, I think, is paramount. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Next speaker, please. 
Next speaker is Leah Rose. Leah, please state your name and address for a record in your comments. Hi, Leah Rose, 8851 Froud Avenue. Um, I just wanted to talk about mask wearing in our town. Uh, this weekend, uh, my family rode our bikes home from the farmer's market and we went on the beach path and it was absolutely packed. And my family, including my two-year-old and my four-year-old had masks on. And I saw only one other family had masks on. It was so crowded that, I mean, at most you could maybe be only a foot away from someone. And I'm really not sure what can be done about this, but the walking path on the weekends in particular is just really unbearable and uncomfortable. COVID is not gone, masks should be used. And it's really not fair to people that want to stay safe and enjoy, enjoy our city in a safe way. So I, I would just really like to know if, if something can be done about this, whether it's, I don't know, the signage issue that's being brought up tonight or, or something else. But I hope that this can really be a priority and that something's done at least for, for the weekends. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Robert Lisbon. Robert, please take your name and address for the record in your comments. Yeah, uh, my name is Robert Lisbon, 88. 55 Collins Avenue. Um, I want to agree with uh, uh, Josh's comments about the Gazette, you know, it, uh, specifically to the town manager. Uh, we do not want our taxpayers' dollars going towards politicians using our money to further their personal agendas, which is what's happening. That's not okay. Um, my family's been in software business for over two decades. Mr. Kessel, your comments about uh, digital signage was spot on. I hope the rest of the commission listens to his insights. Um, the embarrassment, uh, Ms. Nelly Velasquez is yourself, uh, the mayor, the level of dishonesty. Excuse me, I. this the is not for people to come on low, here and insult the level of IQ that you demonstrate okay. the narcissism. Excuse me, can you please? Okay, this, hang this on a is second, Nelly. Nelly, he, he's going to be muted. If he's going to insult and denigrate, okay, then he's not going to get to talk. I'm going to bring him back on now. He's going to get one more chance to stick to the issues, but if he's insulting people, then he's not going to be able to speak. Go ahead, Mr. Lisman. Try to finish your comments. Do I get my time back that you use? No, you don't. Oh, oh okay. So let's switch over to free speech, ironically, right? Uh, your favorite topic that you like to politicize. Um, not allowing a resident to have his question heard by ending the Q&A, that was shameful. Then arbitrarily giving him one minute to finish because of a personal disagreement, also shameful. Telling the commissioner to not speak to him uh, and then muting his mic, asking for his mic to be mute. You sound like the cancel culture you whine about all the time. Um, it's probably difficult hearing uh, people disagree with you when you come from so much privilege and you have so much power, you're probably not used to being held accountable. Uh, you think fairness is oppression? It's not. We all deserve fairness. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay. I think we have one more speaker. Next speaker is Horace Henderson. Horace, please take your name and address for the record in your comments. Good evening, my name is Horace Henderson, uh, 9195 Collins Ave. Um, I simply wanna thank the commission for the uh, hard work that they're doing, um, especially the 96, 92nd Street ramp and the cleanup of the construction sites that you uh, mandated that they take care of. I was sitting by the pool the other day and um, watching them clean it up. And uh, thank you very much for that because it's been a bit of an eyesore for quite a while. Um, and I'd just like to finish up by saying, I like the Gazette, I'm happy with it. Thank you very much, have a good evening. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Diana Gonzalez. Please stay in name and address for the record in your comments. Diana Gonzalez, 9325 Dickens Avenue. Uh, just to mention really um, in general, I think we as uh, speakers and also a commissioner, we don't have the right to be really offending people. There is no way that we can be behaving like that. It's just, I'm calling the neighbors. We need to be together, guys. We need to be together in this. We know who is working with whom, but this is a neighborhood. 
We need to be respectful. They are our representatives, even if we like it or not, even if we don't vote for them or we vote for them. We need to treat the people with respect. I'm really, I'm really tired of seeing the meetings and seeing even faces of the employees in the town that they are really stressful too, because it's a stress for everyone. Please, we need to behave different. Just I'm calling to everyone, try to behave different when you speak. We, anyone has the right to be uh, offending the commissioners or the commissioners to us. N no one has that right. And we need to behave different. I think we are adults. We are in really bad situation in the war in general. And to be behaving like that is really, is really painful. And is no, I think we can do better. We can do better as our neighbors. We can do better as a community, really to be the community. Last meeting I saw that even Sandra was stressful in her shoulder. She was even receiving kind of massage because she was so stressful. And everyone is stressful. We are stressful just hearing that. And the people there sitting in front of us, we have them in the camera. We need to respect people, guys. Please, the people who already speak and is always speaking very aggressive and speeding and with aggression. I mean, we cannot be like that, guys. We can do better. It's all that I want to say. Please calm down and try to come together as a community, not against each other. Thank you. Sorry for Thank me. you. Thank you, Diana. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Deborah Simadevilla. Deborah, please say your name and address for, your, for the record in your comments. Hi again, Deborah Simadevilla, 9108 Abbott Avenue. Um, Diana said exactly what I wanted to say. Uh, last meeting was painful. Uh, at the end there, it was just, um, it's just, it's the reason why I ask people, I mean, I ask people to please be involved, residents to listen to meetings and people don't wanna listen to the meetings because of that nonsense. And like Diana said, if there's, you know, a disagreement, you know, just realize, and, and this is not, I'm not even, it's like Diana said, she just said everything I wanted to say, basically, because the people that call in and, you know, are so aggressive and nasty and, and offending personally, hitting below the belt. What is that, guys? I mean, seriously, we're all adults. You know, we're all pretty intelligent, I, 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 I believe. And for callers to be degrading and insulting and attacking the people that are serving this community as your mayor, vice mayor, commissioners, it's just, it's nonsense. And, and I really, I'm trying to implore everyone, like Diana said, whether you disagree with them, I don't care if, what the disagreement is. If there's something personal going on, please just, you know, try to reach out to them personally because the residents, the taxpayers that want to get things done do not appreciate it. It's just a waste of time. So I just want to thank everybody that's there. And tonight's been fantastic. I, I, I applaud you. Um, and, and so that's that about that. Really quickly, on 90th and Harding, I know that it's, you know, this has been a, for many years we've been talking about it, that dangerous curve. Um, I ask you please to try out to reach out to FDOT again to see what we could do about that curve. I begged for a light. It didn't happen when I was in the traffic committee. Um, I had an idea and somebody else said in next door to put one of those convex mirrors on the opposite, you know, on the uh, south uh, west corner. So the people that are coming from the beach could actually see if there's cars coming, you know, driving south on Harding Avenue. I don't know if that's realistic if you guys could do that temporarily well maybe something more permanently gets done or a combination of efforts but that corner guys is just a nightmare and it's an accident waiting to happen anyways thank you so much everyone i implore you please everybody residents and everybody uh, on the commission please let's try to get through this we have so many things that we need to do and really it doesn't work when we call each other out with nastiness anyways thank you so much God bless everyone. All right, Deb, okay. thank you. Okay, You're good and welfare is closed. Uh, let's go around to the uh, commissioners and get, you know, now we can answer the questions that were asked. Go ahead, Vice Mayor, you're first. 
Uh, yeah, I'd like to reconsider the motion we made on the civility pledge because that would have solved some of these issues that we just experienced. Um, I don't think it should have been deferred. I'd like to change my vote on that one. And um, that's really, that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have a comment about good and welfare? Thank you, Charles, go ahead. Um, yes, and I actually like that we did move to just the one comment, one minute comments um, for a lot of the meeting or the majority of the meeting. Um, three minute, kept, we kept three minute for good and welfare, which I do believe is part of the, um, the rules. Um, so it's not, it's not part of the rules, but I think it's a good idea. Okay, and I have my opinions on that either when we get to the discussion item on decorum and, and rules. Um, so just addressing the comments overall, um, I'd like to thank for the shout out for my insight when it comes to technology, um, because I have lived through it and I know that there's hope. A lot of these issues could be addressed with, with viable tech systems that are not hard to support, including reservations at the, at the uh, tennis center for residents only, um, information that goes out to the signage as well as to the website, as well as to the email list serve, um, all of that. There are solutions at hand and we don't have an IT um, director per se, uh, but those can be worked out. Um, and there is hope, I wanna say to the residents and to the town employees that have to work with these systems. Um, a shout out on the signage front, there was some really positive energy that came out of the, 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 uh, the simple signage discussion. We actually just lost the guy that came up with um, a lot of the basic, you can't really see it, but his name is uh, Raji Cook. And just two weeks ago, he died. He was the one who came up with universal signage for men's rooms, for elevator going up and down, those types of things. And, um, and there's work to be done. It's not necessarily led um, from Surfside, um, but we can contribute. And I agree, good communication and IT solutions go hand in hand. I can't say that often enough, even at risk of sounding like a, bro like a broken record. Um, Sunday code enforcement, that's another issue. I know the town manager wants to get somebody out there on Sundays because there are weaknesses and I pointed those out too. Um, on the word of civility, I think that we all deserve it. Um, the town employees and the, uh, the town, um, each member of the commission um, deserves civility for our town business. Um, that said, when we signed up to be elected officials and we, and we threw our hats in the ring, um, I at least knew that slander and um, and um, it's uh, it's written counterpart part. Sorry, I'm I'm getting distracted, but um, those don't apply to us as an elected official. Um, people can be slanderous towards me, um, and um, you know, and commit the uh, the written form of, of slander, which now is the same burden of proof. Which for us is just kind of open ended. That said. Town residents did not sign up for it, so they shouldn't. They shouldn't have an open access to be to be abused by anybody. So I have a, a much um, higher threshold for my for my um, colleagues on the commission, knowing that um, that we're different. Um, I do like civility within the town meetings. That is um, that is subsidized by the town, and where we should just do the people's business. But that said, anything kind of goes outside. That's you know whether whether you like it or not. And in people's own personal realms of the politicking, you know, it's pretty lenient. Um, so that's what I have to say. And thanks for listening. Great. Thanks, Charles. Anybody else? Nellie? I just want to say that um, I also agree with the um, signs, uh, comments about the signs. I think that we do need to um, take a look at those. I, I'm, I think that they were changed not too long ago. I'm not sure, but... I thought I heard somewhere that they were changed last year um, after the elections. I'm not sure who um, spearheaded that or how that took place, but um, that's what I heard somewhere. Um, in terms of the reservations uh, for the tennis court, I do agree that these should be only for residents, especially right now that we have uh, limited space and, um, and not much to do. So I definitely think that residents should always have priority on these um, reservations. I, I Actually, I don't think anyone else should be reserving other than residents. Um, in terms of civility, I don't think that anyone should be, I'm, I wasn't elected here to have somebody insult me on the commission meeting. 
And that's not right at any level because I don't come here to insult anyone. I come here to give my opinion on the things that we're talking about and the things that benefit our residents. I'm not here to insult anyone on this commission. I am not here to insult our residents either, but I will not also allow anyone to insult me as well because I am here as an elected official elected by the residents of this town, whether you like it or not, but I'm here for the residents of this town and I deserve respect. And so does the mayor and so does Charles and so does Tina and so does Eliana, okay? So that's not right to call in to do, and, and, and our staff, uh, the town manager, the, the, um, our town attorney, our town clerk, everyone deserves respect. So if, if someone wants to call in and make a comment about the situation that's happening in town, I have no problem with that. But when you're addressing someone in a very disrespectful manner, that's not right at any level. And that should be part of, of the civility um, pledge as well. Um, so I have to, um, that's what I have in comments on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh I agree that uh, those signs, and I think the police chief is on, on the call, those uh, small three-foot signs that were put up on in the middle of the street uh, at the, uh, I, I believe it was 89th or 90th Street where that turn is, um, were great. Uh, they got hit a lot, I think, and they finally came down. But I think once people slow down, they'll stop hitting them, and maybe they'll get the idea. I mean, the police have been writing... You know, we've been giving warnings now for six months after we first got elected, but we've gone to writing tickets now. And I, I do notice the traffic on Collins and Harding is noticeably slower. And we will continue to write tickets and we will, we will move towards being known as a Golden Beach, Biscayne Park, and what Val Harbor used to be with respect to speeding. You, you just don't go through Spurside and speed. That's just not something that you will do in the future. We don't want to be a speed trap, but we want all the drivers that are traversing through our town to respect our residents. Um, everybody knows that when the speeds are at 30 miles an hour, the quality of life skyrockets for all the residents. Uh, so I, I totally support anything that we can do um, to uh, get those signs back up and slow the traffic down. Along those lines, um, I sent a uh, the manager and the assistant manager uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, a notice of some funding that's available through Dade County. And we applied for that funding and that funding is directed at those crosswalks that light up where the person who wants to get across the street can push the button and the lights start going off and it's a lot safer. And uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, and first of all, I wanna give a shout out to Jason and. Andy, um, who did a magnificent job with a 48 hour turnaround. They got that grant thing put together and they got that put in and it was really amazing. So guys, thanks very much. And uh, I'm gonna cross our fingers and hope we get that, uh, that grant so we can build all those flashing crosswalks. Because again, that'll be another additional traffic calming device uh, as we go forward. With respect to the resident who called in about the reservations at the tennis center, um, I wholeheartedly agree that Surfside residents ought to be first in line. And I think that uh, we ought to do whatever we can, Tim, if you're on the call, I see you are, um, do whatever you can to change that and make sure that we are not uh, outsourcing our uh, facilities to, uh, to non-residents, although, um, you know, there, there might be a, some sort of accommodation for tourists who, uh, who are staying in our hotels. Uh, the next thing is uh, we had some of the speakers, the ones that were not so friendly on the call, talk about how their questions weren't answered when they wanted them answered. Um, I guess they missed the meeting where we decided to answer all the questions at the end like we're doing right now. So it's unfortunate that it had to get nasty like that, but uh, I think those speakers are all part of the same group and it's, it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, the civility thing is, uh, is, a, is a very important issue. And it, it's funny, I noticed that when the four of us are together at the meetings, um, the meetings are civil. 
and respectful, and they don't go on forever. So um, there must be something going on at these meetings where the four of us are present um, that allows the meetings to flow and function without disharmony. Now, that's not to say we don't disagree. I think we disagree, but we disagree respectfully. And we know where the line is. And we don't use bad words. And we don't make unfounded accusations. A lot of these accusations that folks that are calling in are making are never backed up. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that they say there's lying? Have you noticed that they say that we're not telling the truth, but they never say what that lie was? And they never say what that truth is? Because quite frankly, I for one, and I, I probably speak for all of you, would like to know what those lies are and what those non-truths are, because we're all here. If something's been said and it's not accurate and it's not truthful, I'm going to be the first one to change it. And I think I've made that offer personally, publicly, many times. So if someone wants to get on telephone and they want to say at a public meeting that someone's a liar or a thief or corrupt or a dictator or any of those really, really very bad things, impolite, rude, common, ordinary, and vulgar, as my grandmother used to say, um, Listen, there would be one case where it would be permitted. I mean, listen, if someone's done something really bad, save the epithets, save the insults, and just go right to what's really bad. Put it out there, because that's the most damaging thing. I mean, that's what I would do. If someone's done something really bad or illegal or immoral or unethical, put it out there. And then everybody knows what it is. Okay, enough said on that. Anybody else? I think we're good. Let's keep going. I think, uh, Sandra, we were up to 5E, e, correct? The record, obviously, the, the written form of slander is libel. <laughs> I didn't want to leave that out there. Well, listen, thank you for that, Charles. Appreciate that. Uh, would you please read 5E e again, and then we'll try to start this thing up again? Yes, Mayor. A resolution of the Town Commission with Town of Source at Florida urging Governor DeSantis to increase COVID-19 vaccine allocations to Miami-Dade County in order for the town and other local governments in Miami-Dade County to meet vaccine demands among vulnerable community members, providing for transmittal and providing for an effective date, item 5E. Great. Is there a motion to move that? Tina, thank yes, you. Yes, motion to approve. And a second by Charles. Thank you. Any discussion? Um, sure, I'll just yeah. say some background, and it'll tie in a little bit to the um, to the COVID task force. Um, but um, but you know the some some of the rural counties were prioritized just in terms of the sheer percentage, and um, and I, I I like that this addresses that because we still have residents um, as Jason as Senator Pizzo said, you know no matter how you slice it, um, there are still uh, numbers in the population that are that are on the list and waiting for the first shot, let alone their second. Um, and um, and then the groups that are to come, um, uh, obviously it's good to take care of them too. And to me, this should be an apolitical issue. Um, and um, apolitically, the South Florida and Miami-Dade County are um, are hit harder and will receive you know more rewards from uh, from getting our fair share of the vaccinations, um, if not arguably more than our fair share. Thank you. Okay. Madam Clerk, would you call yeah. the roll, please? Oh, Tina, go ahead. Sure, I'll just add to that. Um, it's pretty It's pretty much self-explanatory. You know, as um, the representative on the Miami-Dade County League of Cities, you know, we meet, um, now we're meeting bi-weekly, but we were meeting every week. And the consensus was to have one voice from all the municipalities and the county so that the message is clear. And um, so this was actually something initiated through the league to have the different municipalities uh, support a resolution urging for our fair share of the vaccine because uh, for anyone who didn't read this in the public, um, the county has the highest number of COVID cases and deaths in the state of Florida, equaling 20% of the overall numbers, yet the county has only received 11% of the allocated vaccine. So it's just, you know, to really try to help people to stay, stay safe. So um, thank you. It's a good idea. Call the roll. Mayor, I have a public speaker. Okay, bring him in. Joshua Epstein, please state your name and address for the record and your comments regarding this item, please. 
Joshua FC 9317, Bay Drive. I mean, this all stems from the same exact thing, the inequitable um, vaccine rollout, but that all stems from what we were just touching on, which is it is a right to participate in a democracy. It's not a privilege. It's not up to anyone with this current one minute that I have to decide who gets to be heard, who doesn't get to be heard. Aggressive and nasty has never meant facts and speaking out. If you want impunity from people speaking out against Mr. you, Epstein, you can become a dictator and autocrat, about... but that is not what this is. Okay. That In terms not... of the vaccine rollout, it 100%... That... Take him off, please. I'm Take speaking him off, about... Jose. Okay, if you're not going to speak to the issue, Mr. Epstein, and you're going to rail and rant, that's not going to work, okay? We're having a productive meeting. If you have something to say on the topic, we'll let you talk next time. Okay. Call the question, Madam Clerk. Commissioner Castle? Yes. Commissioner Velasquez? Absolutely, yes. Vice Mayor Paul? Yes. Mayor Burkett? Yes. Mayor, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank okay, you. we're up to uh, the COVID task force update. Charles? Um, sure, and, and I'll keep it brief. Um, from my perspective, um, I'd like to congratulate everybody at the town for really working together and pulling together for a simple, consistent message. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Commissioner Velasquez, uh, you, Mr. Mayor, um, the Vice Mayor, uh, for, for, um, for, based on my observations, kind of uh, stepping up with the consistent message. You know, we're not out of the woods yet with COVID, and, um, and we saw over the last two months um, a, a, a simplification of the message. Now, this, we noticed that the signage may not be perfect, um, but with the new communication director um, and um, and kind of you know the the um, the team based effort, um, which I'd also like to add is directed by the county. So a lot of the signage that we got um, was you know from the county that it was passed along um, for COVID. But, um, but we're not out of the woods yet. That said, we do have hope. Um, the, the, uh, the strain that is the, um, uh, that is the, you know, the challenge that first showed up in, in Florida um, and now is in, I think, um, almost all the states, you know, that shows that, uh, that COVID and all its different forms uh, you know, is going to continue to be an issue going forward. So uh, we can just be in a position to handle this emergency and other emergencies as they come up. Um, better with every day. And perhaps the town manager wants to add to that, but that's all I have. Thank you, Charles. Andy? I do, actually. Um, uh, a big thank you to Lily, by the way, because what I'm about to say, she kind of connected us with this. We have requested through the health department to be an outreach site for COVID vaccines. We have requested up to 500. Uh, we think that we will probably get 250, but you, you obviously go in high. Uh, and these vaccines would be for those who qualify in our town to receive the vaccine, um, both residents and employees that, that meet the criteria. And we would, have it, we would have a site here in town. We should know in about two to three days. Uh, we just got all this information. I did shortly before the meeting. That's why you're all hearing it now. And it's actually easy for me to tell you all at once. Uh, but but that's good news. So we're uh, the Department of Great. Health will provide all the elements needed. We just have to provide the location. Before it was a lot of moving parts. We had to get a doctor. We had to store it. We had to do a lot of things. But that all that's been taken out of the equation. I think they're trying to get those out. Obviously, quicker and and closer to the community. So we, just to let you all know, we have, uh, we have um, accomplished step one. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Nellie and then oh, that's Tina. Wo that's wonderful news, um, Andy. Thank you very much for that update. I'm very happy to hear that. And also that, a big thank you to Yami. She, she's on here. She's, she's doing the legwork. So she's oh, great. Thank really you, doing Yami. a great job for us in that. And again, thank you, Lily, for pointing that out to us. Thank you, Lily. Lily, good work. Okay, Tina. Okay, so uh, yes, I'd like to thank our staff. Uh, I, I can start with, um, you know, I've been working with Andy and I asked him to, um, you, you know, in the, in the initial stages of this um, COVID, uh, our, we had staff that was doing outreach, calling different um, members of our community, um, senior members. And so I, I'd asked Andy to um, try to assist with the vaccine and 
call people and see who uh, needed help getting getting it, you, you know, getting their appointments. And he has directed staff to do that. So I want to thank him for that and thank the staff who had made those phone calls to the residents. Uh, a special thanks to our police force and our code enforcement because they're the ones going out there and asking people to wear the masks. And it, it was uh, sorry to hear what the resident said on the good and welfare about the walking path. I've seen that too when I do go out to the beach. Uh, on Sunday, I went out to the farmer's market and I have to say we had compliance at the farmer's market. Um, pretty much everyone was wearing a mask. If they weren't, they put it on once they started to walk in. Uh, I can't see the same from my walk over there. The walk over there was a lot of people without masks. Um, I think it's just a mixed message and we have to just continue with the message of, you know, protecting each other, protecting the community. So, um, yeah, I, I, if we can maybe do a little more outreach on, on the walking path, I've seen an improvement in the business district. I was in the business district, uh, well, Sunday, and, and yeah, it was a lot better a lot more compliance. So, so I think we're making progress. So uh, um, thank you to everyone and the people in the community who get this and, and are doing the right thing. Thank you. Very, very good. Okay, we have another speaker on this subject. You know, I just wanna make a point here before we bring in the speaker. Um, the uh, former commission did not allow residents to speak on every subject. And that was one of the things that I said I was going to do when I became the mayor, since the mayor runs the meetings. It's important for me to hear from every speaker, whether, you know, we like it or not. That's the way it goes. But again, the speakers should be on topic and not use it to conduct a witch hunt or rage about uh, one of their pet peeves. So, um, we're going to one minute for everybody talking about these items. We go to three minutes on good and welfare. And if the speaker goes off the topic, then they can't talk anymore. Go ahead and bring the speaker in, Madam Clerk. Joshua Epstein, please say your name and address for the record and comments. Joshua Epstein, 9317 Bay Drive. I obviously want to thank the town for all the efforts that they've done with the mask mandate. It's not been enough. I mean, if you look at the statistics, just nine out of the 10 top states that have the lowest death tolls have had mask mandates in place. So the praising of Governor DeSantis in the town gazette using town resources is not acceptable. And this relates to COVID because I think we ought to ask the governor again, put a mask mandate back into place. Even the Republican, the Republican governor of West Virginia said the mask is the best weapon we have. And he doesn't understand why states are repealing mask mandates or didn't have them in place in the beginning. I think we ought to put the focus back on the mask. People will not all be vaccinated until July, we're still in the middle of this crisis. And to use town resources, taxpayer money, to try to run a political campaign for a, an elected official, Governor DeSantis, is unacceptable. He's had a, fa we failed this state just because we're in the middle and close to California, which has a Democratic governor and has failed also. You're, you're comparing us to a state- Thank that you, is Mr. Epstein. Thank you. Okay. Um, my comments are COVID on COVID or this. I think that the statistics are fine, are, are important rather. And I think that uh, I'll start by saying, I think wearing a mask is a good idea. There are conflicting uh, opinions on masks, but you know what I've said, personally, I've said since the beginning, even if you don't agree, wear it out of respect. Okay, wear it out of respect for other people who are frightened. Wear your mask, wear your mask, wear your mask. The only time I don't wear my mask is when I'm out exercising. That's the only time I don't wear my mask. Okay, but I want to bring to everybody's attention some uh, some interesting statistics. Um, you know, we learned in the uh, in a news blast that the town sent out recently. Uh, it said that there were, as of March 5th, a total of 1,426 new COVID cases in Dade County, and the state's positivity rate was 5.12%. That's Those are interesting statistics, but they have to be put in context. So I just want to share with you a little context. On March 5th, first, as of March 5th, there were 1,426 new cases reported, as I said. However, in early January, there were 5,114 new cases, meaning that since January, 
The current number of cases being reported has declined 75%. That's good news, okay? That's really good news. That's a 75% decline from the January high. Second, on March 5th, the positivity rate was reported as 5.12%. In January, in Dade County, the positivity rate was 10.57%. That means the positivity rate has dropped more than 50% in the last two months. Again, something we can be hopeful about. But here's the most important statistic. In the last 30 days, according to the Florida Department of Health's own website, COVID deaths have dropped from 175 to 10. That's a 95% decrease. So whatever Florida is doing, whatever Dade County is doing, whatever we're doing, we're going in the right direction and that's a hopeful sign. And I just wanted to put that out there for everybody. So congratulations to everything you're doing. Congratulations, Mr. Manager, to your staff. Thank you for, for making sure that everybody wears a mask and uh, we'll get through this together as they say. Anybody else on that subject before we move on? Nellie? No, I and just then Tina. Oh, oh, sorry. No, just Nellie. mention there was a letter that came from um, the um, county mayor, um, Ms. Kava, and she was mentioning that if uh, we continue to go in the right direction, she's going to remove the uh, curfew. So I think uh, this is all good news. I think we're, 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 close to hopefully some someday soon be out of this this very horrible situation that we're all in. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Tina? Okay. Yes, Mayor. I, I just wanted to go back to your statement about the former commission because I sat there for four years and residents were allowed to speak on every topic. They were asked to stay on topic. That is correct. But they were allowed to speak at every topic. And it's I was there. So I, I just have to be clear about that. It's funny, I was there too. You came, I, I think, only once. I, 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 I was there. I, I was there and I watched the meetings on TV. So, you okay. know, I, I, I didn't have to come to watch what happened. And I and I can tell you that, you know, as a matter of fact, I experienced it personally. I was absolutely interrupted and shut down, which is why I'm so adamant about letting people speak. Okay, that's that's a very important thing. Okay, I'm, but, I'm not trying to cause an argument, but I sat well, there. Well, let's let's not. Okay. That let's, let's not. I I was there, and I I was part of it. I experienced it. You were okay. Last. Let's let's move on. Okay. Uh, the next item is nine B, which is amending the town code. Which is funny. It's right that's on top. Not of civil. It. What just happened? You know, what happened? Did I miss something? Okay whole argument of whether well, the previous oh, no. I, I, no, 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 that's, that's, that's listen, that, that's not, you know what? I, I, I commend Tina. That was very respectful. She's got an opinion and I've got an opinion and there was no screaming. There was no yelling. There was no accusing. It was just a difference of opinion. And now she stopped talking and I stopped talking. That's the way it is. And in this system, in this setting, what we do is everybody gets to talk. Everybody gets to express their own opinion. They don't get to interrupt, they don't get to scream, they don't get to yell, and they don't get to accuse, but then they get to vote. And that's how we do it. That's how a civilized, respectful commission does it. And listen, I was not offended at all by that. I, listen, Tina and I, we, we have a difference of opinion, but we also agree sometimes. It's all good. It's all good. Anyway, isn't that right, Tina? No comment. I, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm trying 173, go to page 173. Um, this has been on the agenda since the beginning. And, uh, I put this on here because I wanted residents to have more options to speak. Okay. And there were, there were, uh, for instance, uh, public discussion on agenda items. It says no, it used to say no citizen shall be entitled, okay, to, to address the town commission on any matter. And I've changed that to say, citizens shall be permitted to address the town commission on any matter. 
Okay. So if at good and welfare, you want to get up and you want to talk about something, it's okay. It's okay. And then it, it goes on to, uh, it used to say, uh, shall be limited to no more than three minutes. Okay. I took that out because if a resident has something they want to say that's important to this commission, I think they should be able to hear it. One of the other things is the decorum rules on page 175. Uh, any person making impertinent or slanderous remarks, I took out impertinent because I think as Charles said earlier, I think we're elected officials. And if a resident feels very strongly about something we've done, that's legitimately wrong, they have a right to uh, put that out there and put it on the table. So I, I wasn't comfortable with not allowing people to make impertinent comments. If they want to make impertinent comments, they can make an impertinent comment, but they can't slander people, okay? And they can't use bad language. And they can't become boisterous or interrupt or disrespectful, okay? So that's the gist of this. And I just want to bring this to your attention right now because my intention is, is for all of us to look at this and what I intend to do now, my next step, is I intend to put this language in final form and circulate it to you and bring it back at the next meeting for approval. Because I think we needed to address that part of the code which restricted citizens' rights to speak. Anybody have a comment on that? Yes, Charles? sir. Um, and I reviewed what your edits were and it made sense to me. Thank you for explaining. Um, I agree with them. Um, I've just been jotting down my additional suggestions for consideration um, of the full commission, uh, which I think may allow us to be more efficient. Um, I was surprised to see the one minute time limit because this was actually going to be one of my suggestions. Um, because when you simply just lay out the agenda and you break it down with time um, and hour by hour, um, when we have these discussion items, when we have X number of items on the, um, you know, up for a resolution or an ordinance, the readings, and then we allow three minutes for all of us, three minutes for everybody that wants to talk, and then maybe another round of three or two, as opposed to another round of one, you quickly do the math and you realize that it's not sustainable <laughs> to use that sustainability um, word again. Um, so I would propose actually that we have kind of a breakdown of the evening um, in terms of a timeline. Not that it has to be adhered to strictly. We know good and welfare comes at 8.15. Uh, but if we break down the agenda, we'll actually have an idea, I think, of how far we will get. Um, but some other ideas that I had um, was, um, um, you know, for, for, uh, for proposals that the presentations be targeted to about five minutes. Um, commissioner comments, I think, uh, could use three minutes on some of the bigger issues like ordinances and passing those. Um, but for the discussion items, I think that two minutes we could probably use with one minute options to extend. Um, I spoke with, I spoke about the, um, the good and welfare. I think it's important to, I advocate, you know, keeping two to three minutes for the residents because they may have an issue that requires some education that's new. Um, and that's what that's supposed to be for, something that's kind of outside the box and not on the agenda. Um, but I think that the one minute beyond that, you know, if not one, then two um, for public comment on each issue would be enough. Seems like people could be succinct and I'll be succinct as well. Um, I do like the fact that the town attorney kind of has, um, uh, she is the one that, that, um, that is really like in control when there's points of order or some, something up for, for discussion where we might need her, um, uh, not intervention, but her to kind of speak up and call when we get off point. Um, and I think that that's a good thing to, to use, just that simple point of order, which I know I was using in one meeting kind of in jest, but I think that is a call, like, like a, a self-check for our commission when one of us does go off on a tangent, um, myself included, that point of order would bring us back to, to the point of order and, and the point of discussion. Um, and I had um, that, you know, we're at our best when we have, um, you know, when we put principles above personalities and, um, and that professional, professionalism and civility expected for the town employees also applies, I think, to elected officials, as we mentioned, um, and in a quality town, I think we all deserve it. 
And, um, and it's not about limiting speech outside of official meetings, because as, as I said blatantly, I'm under the impression and I'm under, under like the, um, you know, the uh, realization that the law does not protect elected officials from slander and, um, and libel. And the town attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, but everything that I've read, um, those standards don't apply because of our chosen, um, chosen uh, path on this. So, um, you know, we could also put a maximum on the number of discussion items or resolutions per member of the commission. That would also be allow, allow us to focus. And then things that go beyond the max of say three or four for each of us could be in like the, 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 uh, the wait, like a waiting list. So it goes on maybe a separate document so that it doesn't seem so overwhelming when we look at an agenda with discussion items that go in, you know, beyond the letters of the alphabet. Um, so those are my suggestions, and uh, they were very timely. Um, I was going to issue a memo, but I didn't a memo to supplement well, this item. But Charles, I save it, save it, because I, what I want to do is circulate a clean copy of this. It's just going to be a few pages anyway, because there's only a few pages that apply to speakers and decorum. Uh, the rest is is, you know, probably housekeeping stuff. But I'm going to circulate it and then open it up. Everybody should add their comments. And then what we can do is we can we have a list of all the comments and then the commission can decide what it wants to put in and what it wants to take out at the next meeting. Anybody else want to comment? Tina? Okay, hold on a second. We got the clerk with her hand up. Yeah, Mayor, I just wanted to address the commission if I may through you. The, okay. agenda, the, the agenda is actually um, timestamp as, as what you were actually suggesting. If you look at the consent agenda, it says set for approximately 7.30. And then for, if you go to ordinances, it says set for approximately, and because this, this month we don't have any, it says NA. And then resolutions, I put set up for approximately 945, and so on. And that's just an approximately time like you were actually requesting, but I wanted to bring it up to your attention. Thank you. No problem. You. And also the resolutions, there is a limit as to how many resolutions a commissioner may bring forward as well. Um, I could send you that section of the code. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Vice Mayor, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, actually, I would like to ask um, our attorney about this because, uh, you know, I've read this a this hundred times and this um, uh, procedure for meetings, it's, it's been, uh, it was revised when I first joined the commission. And then when our attorney joined the commission, it was revised again and it was revised to meet um, more like uh, to be in line with the county uh, rules of procedure, and um, it's for it's used for every board and committee. And so, you know, I read this your version of it several times, and then when I uh, became the liaison for uh, tourism board, I read I, it was sent to me, and I read it again, and that was just the version we're working under now, and and I have no problem with it. So um, I'll be happy to look at your clean version and see how that reads, because it's still a little confusing. But yeah, it I is. It, it, it is confusing. I, I don't like, because there are some there are some things that were changed by the prior commission, and we need a clean version so we can we can all see it and put our print on it. That's the goal. Well, if, if I may ask the attorney, because, um, you know, when it was present, you know, I, we had changed it once and then when it was presented to us to change again, um, I, I was back then. I was told this is more in line with what the county is doing, so I, I'm okay with that. So if, if we could hear from Lily, sure, Lily. Well, you're, you're right, uh, Commissioner Paul. When I joined as the town attorney, we did make some changes to these rules. Um, however, if you if it's the will of the majority of the commission to make further changes. You can within the parameters of the law. Um, um, yeah, it's really your policy direction. Uh, but can I just ask, is it, uh, um, this was modeled after the counties, is that correct? Because that was what I was told way back when we, we approved it. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's modeled after the county, but we also follow Robert's rules of procedure, which we've adopted in this particular provision. Um, I think that most, most cities and counties have similar rules, but they can be tweaked and refined to suit the needs of the particular commission. But um, Tina, just as an example, 
you know, the, the last commission that you were talking about required people to fill out little cards. And if they didn't jump through that hoop, all of a sudden they couldn't speak. So everybody was rushing around, filling out little cards. And I thought that was ridiculous. So I've changed it. It says registration of speakers. It used to say shall be required. Okay. I don't think we should require those hoops. I said, I changed it to registration of speakers shall be encouraged. So if they want to register, we encourage that, but we don't, that's not a stumbling block we put in front of people that want to express themselves. And that was a big stumbling block because every, you had to fill out a card for every subject you wanted to speak on, which was a joke. It was a joke. And if the county does that, I think it's a joke too. I, I don't know that the county does that. Um, well, it was a joke. I mean, uh, when I was coming to the meetings to speak, I filled I filled out the cards too. And yeah, well, I, I I'm not filling out the cards. Okay. Well, you don't and need to. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I'm not I'm not requiring the cards to be filled out while I'm here. So. Okay. Well, let's else? go to the clean copy to read. Okay, I'll do that. Anybody else have a comment? We have one speaker. Bring in the speaker, Madam Clerk. Gibson, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Sure, I'd like to start off by requesting three minutes to speak on this because it's not a rant. It's a list Denied. of every single thing. It, it, Denied. It to a vote Please of the commission. Ahead. It's a vote of the commission, so I'd like the commission to vote on it. Run the clock. Where is the clock? I'm asking for you to vote on it so I can have three minutes. It's a vote of the commission, not just you. Run the clock. Can Keep you vote talking, on Mr. Epstein. It. Ridiculous. The only thing left out of it pretty much is a scepter, a crown, and a nice palace for you. This, All right. This gives you, no, this gives Cut you impune off. power. Take, take them off. That's it. Okay. Anybody else on that subject? All right. Next. I'm sorry. Oh yeah. More speakers. Okay. Diana, go ahead. Diana, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Diana Gonzalez, 9325 Dickens Avenue. I think just those changes that you are analyzing right now is good. Just like you mentioned, because I was there when last time was ditch. When they even use the police to pull the people out, did you were disagree or something? That was really uh, horrible. I remember those experiences seeing the mayor using the police and putting the police in that uncomfortable position, pulling out neighbors from the room. That was really disgusting. I think the change that you do try to be just something that is rational. I mean, and we don't have to use the whole time, and it's better to reduce that time because sometimes we are going around and around and around, or using that time just to insulting people or to say things without a sense. Just something that is rational and makes that things easy would be great. Thank you for your work, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, speaker who has not spoken before. Lisa Boymer Green, please state your name and address for the record and your comments, please. Hi, Alicia Boimel Green, 9173 Kalal Avenue. Um, if we're discussing meetings, I'd like to bring up the topic of when we're going to move back into chambers. Um, and enough with the Zoom. If we are continuing with Zoom, I think that something should be included about decorum for Zoom um, in terms of muting, which has become a problem here. And also in terms of um, commissioners being required to be present um, at their desks or, you know, in some type of professional environment while they're voting. Um, I've seen it in the commission meeting. I've seen it at some um, board meetings where people are doing a whole variety, variety of things. I don't think it's professional, and I don't think that it's conducive to you know, the weight and the respect of the position that's required. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we're gonna close the uh, public input on that. And I think we'll get we'll get the commission a, uh, a clean copy and circulate it and see if we can get a draft that everybody's happy with. The next item is item C, demolition by neglect. Uh, I put this on, I just wanted to make the commission aware that, you know, we've got that uh, beautiful Art Deco building that's standing out there and is uh, is potentially being, yes, thank you, Tina. I love that. And uh, that was good. That was good. That's you would have thought we planned it like that. 
Um, and I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that building demolished by neglect because in Miami Beach, the old trick was open the windows, let the roof leak, uh, let that simmer for about a year and a half, and then come to the commission and say, "Oh shucks, you know the building is uh, is uh, is is damaged beyond repair." Well, number one, as a builder and a a guy that did historic rehabs for 25 years, nothing is ever beyond repair. So we, you know, that excuse would never fly at this commission with me sitting here. And I don't think it would fly with some of the other commissioners. But um, I think we need uh, an ordinance that talks about that. And what this says is basically, um, if you neglect your building and, uh, you know, you're, we will go in there and we will secure it. We will secure it. We will make sure at your cost that that building is safe and it's not demolished by neglect. So um, there is a Miami Beach draft, which I would like permission from the commission to get um, with Lily on and then bring it back at the next meeting for your review. We'll circulate it, of course, before the next meeting. And uh, hopefully we can uh, we can add that into our zoning code while we're uh, doing all the other work with our zoning code. Any comments? Tina. Yes. Um, so I, I was actually speaking with, well, e uh, emailing back and forth with Tony this week um, regarding, uh, you know, there was, I don't know if, how many of you know, um, the little house on 88th Street in Byron was de demolished. Um, we, we saw it getting torn down. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, there's no protections in place for existing structures. Um, I, I'd ask to have that put into the new code that um, a building can't be demolished until there's a building permit in place. Uh, if you look at 88th Street between Collins and Harding, that's been an empty lot for over seven years. Um, but on um, Harding and 91st Street, they had a, their plan was approved and they demolished the buildings and were sitting there with vacant lots. Um, houses too, they get torn down and, and the vacant lot sometimes it's there for like five years. And so uh, it was something I was trying to do, you know, when I when I first was elected um, five years ago, and it, and it just it morphed into something else. It was kind of I was encouraged and encouraged, and then it just fell apart. And seeing that um, house getting well, Tina, what down, specifically would you generally generally would you sort of like to see happen? Well, well, like seeing that other house being torn down, I mean, basically, you know, if it's to be demolished, it's inevitable, you know, because we're not dealing with historic structures. I mean, to some of us, it's historic, but it's not under protection. But ultimately, you know, um, for instance, a person buys an empty lot. They don't know what sat there before. Maybe they would want to preserve an element of it if, if they saw that, but because it's gone, they have no idea. They're, they're getting a blank canvas, you know, sometimes you get, you see what's there and you say, oh, that's kind of neat. Maybe I'll keep that section and build up on it, it you know. So it's just to um, re really to protect the this, this integrity of the character of the neighborhood, um, you know, to a degree. You know, that, and if someone has a commitment to p put a new project there, well, then just just that. so you, Just so you know, mm -hmm. um, all, all the hubbub about that uh, pre-1970 um you know, where the residential, some of the people in the residential area thought it applied to their houses. And, and quite frankly, as I read it, it could, but uh, I think the intention was for it to apply to the older buildings on Collins and Harding. Um, it's getting rewritten. It was in the existing code. I did not put it in there and nobody, none of us put it in there, but uh, it's, it's something that we're looking at to improve the language on. And maybe um, that kind of dovetails with what you're saying. Maybe there is sort of a, a process that would slow down the demolition a little bit. Um, I don't know that you can stop owner, homeowners from, you know, doing what they want to do on their lots, but um, certainly maybe there's a process by which we can slow the process a little bit, which would give us some time to reach out to the homeowner and look at all the options and maybe, maybe have a different outcome. But right. I, I agree with you on that. So yeah. um, I mean, it's I, not, I, I know that we may not be able to stop the process, but it, it just like, you're not leaving, you know, it's blighted when you have all these vacant lots too. And so, you know, just not to leave it like that. Well, listen, I think that, you know, it, it, some of these 
empty lots might look better than some of the wrecked houses that are on there right now. But uh, certainly if they're historic and they add to the charm of the neighborhood, I'm with you. Well, that's the demolition by neglect. You know, it's, well, easy, to, it's easy well, to do in any situation. But okay, so we'll we'll have that. What I want to do is I want to get it'll be back on the agenda next next month, like the other thing, like the uh, like the conduct of meetings, and we'll have a draft on the conduct of meetings, and we'll have a draft on the demolition by neglect. Would anybody else like to speak on that? Yes, Madam Clerk, and then I'm going to get Nellie and Lily. Mayor, just to clarify, and Lily, um, if you could just um, let me know if I'm wrong. For both the amending the town code section, which is item 9B and demolition by neglect 9C, are you looking to bring them back as a discussion item or, or to bring them back as an ordinance already? No, no, discussion item. Uh, you know, discussion item, just like it is tonight, but it'll there'll be an ordinance that the commissioners and the vice mayor will have reviewed. I'm not an ordinance, I'm sorry. There'll be language, a proposed ordinance. You, we, we, the, our town code section 2-205, in order to be uh, an, an ordinance to be placed on the agenda, a town commissioner needs to get support of the majority of the commissioners present. Okay, so let's call it something else. Let's just say, Lily, what do we need? We, a draft, you know, just a, a, a rough draft of what the ordinance would look like. It's not the ordinance yet. Right, so it wouldn't be first reading of the ordinance formally, Correct. but it could be another discussion item with a revised uh, and code Tina, provision. It attached. would have draft written all over it. Lily, the code says in big in big letters. Yes, Madam oh. Clerk. The or, the resolution the section of the code says ordinance may be prepared and scheduled on the agenda at the direction of the town commission. A town commissioner with the support of the majority of the commissioners present at a town commission meeting or by the town manager, town attorney, or town clerk. But it's not an ordinance right now, right? It wouldn't be. It's not. Te it's not technically an ordinance yet. It's just uh, a another draft. Where to put it? Okay, it would be another discussion item with another draft of this proposed uh, ordinance. It's not first reading of the ordinance. It's just right. a discussion item. Is right. that correct? Yes, that's okay. right. Okay, Charles, I'm going to get you, but uh, uh, Nelly was next, and then I'll get you. Oh no, actually, Charles had his hand up first. Go ahead, Charles. Well, oh my gosh, go ahead, Charles. This is so civil. I love it. <laughs> um, but my question is, is, is what's lacking in the existing code where we can't enforce safety issues related to an, to an existing property? Because I would think that whether it's a, a you know, a, a pool that is, that is drained and kids could fall into or a structure that's unsound and could fall over, that the town has rights to police that, um, for lack of a better word, and certainly enforce code violations that make it a safety issue, regardless of whether it's under construction or not and where it is in terms of- That's, that's a good point, Charles. And I think Miami Beach struggled with that. And I think they elected to add this, but let's, let's hear from, uh, maybe Jim can talk about that or Lily can talk about that. Jim, do you want to opine on that? Maybe his mic is not coming on. Okay, but Nelly, while Jim gets his mic off. Yeah, my, my, my comment was in line with what um, Charles is saying as well. Um, my, my concern with that is the safety of uh, residents. And, you know, kids are curious and they see an empty property and, you know, they'll go in there and God forbid that house is in, not in good condition and it collapses on on a resident where as to having an empty lot um, gives more safety towards the residents, um, specifically, you know, younger, younger kids, you know, teenagers that they like to do that kind of stuff or, you know, that that's, that's really my concern in terms of preserving a particular building like the one that Tina showed us in the picture which was a condition for even approving that project. That's something that I, I agree with completely. I mean, that building was set to be preserved and they have not done that. I mean, I, I, up until just recently when they were asking to have the building demolished and rebuilt and all this other stuff, I mean, they had the windows open, there was doors open. I mean, they were not taking care of this building at all. 
And until I think all of us, you know, mention that, you know, yeah, take care of this. That's not an excuse for you to just come here and knock it down when that was the condition for approving everything. Okay, well, let's um, do my, this. My concern is just that, that, you know, uh, and send, uh, buildings that are not in, in good condition could be it. I, I think there'll be two speeds. Go ahead, Lily. Yeah, I just want to say um, great, good points from Commissioner Kessel and Velasquez. I think we need to look at this together with our property maintenance standards uh, ordinances and make sure that those are sufficiently in place to require people to maintain their property and what can the town do in the event that they do not do that. Um, so we need to work with those provisions together when we do this uh, demolition by neglect to make sure Good. property standards are in place. Right, so we're gonna do that. There'll be, it, we'll look at what we've got right now, right? And we'll bring that to you along with the uh, proposed language for the demolition by neglect. Nelly, go ahead. No, I just wanted to add, as a matter of fact, my neighbor um, who's constructed a new house on this particular lot that I'm going to discuss right now, he was getting a whole bunch of fines from the town and everything. And finally, he um, got his permits approved and everything. And he demolished the house, I think, before even everything was done. But it was it was very, the house was ugly. There was a lot of problems with the house. Um, the house needed to be demolished because it was an, it, it was an accident waiting to happen. And I just wanted to add, I think that what we need to also do is maybe um, give a better direction and guidelines to our design board if what we want to do is preserve the character of our town. Because if what we want is are that Mediterranean style that we already have and the one-story buildings and all this other stuff, then these are things that we need to really discuss in a design board so we're not continuing to get these more modern houses if that's what 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 the direction of the of the commission is um but in in, in terms of um addressing the demolition i think it needs to be on a basis of the um the soundness of the structure okay jim um you're i i don't want to put you on the spot tonight um and I, 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 you may not even have an answer, and that's quite all right. No, no harm, no foul. But did you want to opine on what are uh, any standards that you know about in our town right now, or you know what exists? I mean, along the lines of what uh, Commissioner Kessel was talking about. Well, I can just tell you from my perspective, since I'm just two days in town, and I am, do not have quite knowledge about the town's intent as to preser preservation of historic buildings. But I'm a native of St. Augustine. I come from our nation's most historic city. And I know that if you dig the shovel into the ground, the new Hilton that went up there about 12 years ago, which actually was constructed to be period correct. You look at it, it looks like it fits right in with Old Town, yet it's right with the modern codes, completely up to date with the modern codes of that day. So it can be done. And and if you put a shovel into the ground and hit something hard, you get an archaeologist on the site. Now that's a bit of an extreme because this is not a 1565 city. But my my past in Venice, we had an architectural overlay district as part of the zoning code for the gateway to the city. Uh, many cities are searching for their soul statewide, and buildings should be there on purpose, not by default or by decay. And I, I strongly urge you to search your souls as to where you want this town to go. And many cities would kill for some some type of history, some type of downtown with character. And uh, it's something, if you have it, uh, don't let it go by default. Decide yay or nay and pursue accordingly. That's my okay. advice. I'm well, here to that's, help. That's, I'm that's, here to help. That's, back, back to Florida. That's, great. that's great advice, Jim. Thank you. Um, um, we have design guidelines, and I know that we're incorporating those into the new code. And Nelly, to your point, you're exactly right. Um, that's something that the uh, planning board needs to look at along with the commission and just decide, because that I think, and I, I don't see that uh, George Kuzlis is on the call anymore, but uh, you know that's exactly what George was talking about at the planning board meeting and at the commission. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we've got the power to sort of 
you know, push forward our vision of what the town should be like in those design guidelines. It's an extra layer of protection for us. Anyway, Tina, go ahead, and then I'm going to get the uh, the town speakers. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just um, to uh, what Commissioner Kessel and uh, Commissioner Velasquez said. Uh, a perfect example. There was a house on Emerson. I had gotten complaints from neighbors that um, it was, you know, it was kind of left derelict. There was no. Uh, they were working on it, and then they stopped. And this was like uh, pre, like a week before COVID. And uh, it had nothing to do with our, our uh, construction issues. And it was, there was no fence around it. There were uh, lots, of, lots of openings and, and there are standards. And I had, I had to report it to code. I had to report it to the building official because uh, it needed to be, you know, they have, the homes have to be boarded up to a degree so that they're not open like that. It was definitely a hazard. We were lucky nobody wandered into there. Um, you know, there were a lot of concerns from the neighbors about animals possibly getting in there. And, and it, took a, it took a while before we could actually get something done. And they, they started doing the work and they're doing a beautiful renovation of that home, which is really nice to see because it looked like it could be torn down because it was in such disarray. And if you pass by there now, it's, it's really quite beautiful. It's coming along nicely. So um, there, there's a lot of potential for, for that. Um, I think uh, it would be really beneficial if we have a joint meeting with the PNZ board so we can talk about all these things and learn their ideas and see what we can do to move forward because we're, we're coming into, uh, we have two different uh, sets of people trying to get things done here. There's new construction and there's uh, additions and renovations of old homes and they need to be treated differently. And, and that's part of doing a new code is, is um, realizing that and finding a way for it to harmonize. So you, you don't have what, what people are complaining about, the big house next to the small house. There has to be a way to tailor that. You know, I'm, I'm not against new, new construction at all. It's not, you know, it, it's just about uh, respect for the character of the neighborhood and compatibility. And I think that's right. what we're all looking for. We're all looking for that. And uh, we're gonna have a fresh uh, version of the proposed code go around with the changes that that you all have talked about and we will continue to work on it. And yes, we will have that meeting with the planning and zoning board and we will continue to have workshops. Madam Clerk, please bring in the first speaker. First speaker is Joshua Epstein. Joshua, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Joshua Epstein, 9 through 17, Bay Drive. I wanna say I'm obviously in support of this and mention the fact that I said nothing to warrant me becoming being muted at the last, during the last topic. I didn't say anything inflammatory I said that you were giving yourself additional power and it was a power grab by the mayor. Okay, that is Mr. All I Epstein, said and that was are factual, you talking about that demolition by neglect or not? Speak of cancel culture, but you mute anyone who speaks out against you. It is That's it. unacceptable. It okay. is not an authoritarian Turn him off, please. form of government. Turn him will off. Not okay, next speaker, please. Next speaker is Jeff Rose. Jeff, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Jeff Rose, 8051 Froud Avenue. Uh, I want to piggyback off what the minister, the mayor said. It was definitely brought up about the design review guidelines at the, at the planning and zoning meeting. And that's definitely, uh, I'm, I'm in agreement. It's complete support of that does need to be updated. Um, Vice, Payor, uh, Vice Mayor Paul, I believe you, uh, actually, I believe, I know you can't do any demolition on any, at least single family home but without having an active valid permit. So um, I don't, I know the house that you're talking about, but I, they had to have at least an active permit to demolish the house. They may not have had an approved house. That's a whole nother process that I'm sure, as we all know, takes a little bit of time, but I'm sure they had an active demolition permit to take that house down. Um, the other thing, um, what Commissioner Velasquez said, there are some homes that are not safe and should, would be better off if they were taken down. Um, and there's also obviously tax reasons why people want to take down their house um, and just have it be a land while they're waiting to get their building permit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else before we move on to the next subject? Okay. So we will bring that back at the next meeting. Uh, I, the next item D was deferred to uh, next month. Uh, item E is free hassle free downtown parking for residents. Um, when I was the mayor last, 10 years ago, I implemented this for residents. Uh, it was very, very popular, but over the years, uh, they began to add charges. I think it's $10 for each uh, 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 decal. I don't think there ought to be charges. And I think that uh, some families 
uh, have cars. I think we need to redo the, uh, the rules, but we need to encourage our residents to go downtown. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be bringing back a, uh, I'm working with staff right now on an idea where we're going to try to utilize the uh, underutilized parking lot, which is to the south of the downtown district and, and maybe get a tram that goes around from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. and brings people into the downtown where they can park at that lot because, you know, we want to make it as convenient as possible for people to come to park and to shop. But this hassle-free parking, I just wanted to see if there was some uh, support for sort of redesigning the program so that residents actually get free parking and don't have to pay um, to get the decal and can also get more than one decal if they have a registered car in this town. So if they have two registers, car, registered cars in Surfside, they can get two free decals. But if the car is obviously not registered here, then it's a different story. Anybody? Yes, Nellie, and then Charles. Uh, well, like on my block, what they give us um, to park is a, um, a little tag that you hang on your on your um, mirror there. Well, I assume that those things are more expensive than just a regular sticker. Um, but I do support not charging residents um, anything at all to park anywhere in our town. Um, I think that that's something that uh, this town makes enough money to be able to give that to our residents. And I mean, we put millions of dollars in the bank every year in excess money. Um, so to not charge $10 is I think, a nice gesture um, towards our residents. And um, I definitely support something like this. Okay, uh, Charles. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a case of like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it um, in that it's a nominal fee that's charged. Um, I don't mind paying for it. Um, this is of something that the town does that I think does work quite well. Um, that said, I'm gonna give another shout out to the, the, the value of some easy tech solutions um, because this town has um, you know, multiple ways to keep track of its residents, which are quite complicated and labor intensive and, um, and inconvenient for residents. Uh, whether it's parks and rec access or the, um, the, the decal that goes on our cars to allow for the parking um, or trying to find phone numbers to call people in a crisis like COVID um, or update the email list serve. <laughs> um, the town is behind with technology and there are solutions at hand that can, um, that can make it not only keep working um, working smoothly, um, but do what you're asking for, Mr. Mayor, which I agree with is like make it so low maintenance that we can reapply the dollars that go towards um, towards taking everybody's you know information and issuing them year after year um, to just having it somehow automated, um, whether it's based on um, on property manage or property owners or whatnot. You know we have a way to get the water bills and the sewer and water bills to people whether they're actually the property owner or the person whose name is on the lease. So somebody's got to take a big picture view to, to, to um, you know, unshackle the town from, uh, from the systems that just aren't worth what, what each of them um, adds up to be. Um, so it's, it segues into my quality control, quality assurance. It also ties into the town sign, town uh, digital signage issue earlier. Like um, I feel sometimes we're our own worst enemy because, um, you know, in order for a solution like this to be implemented, it requires reinventing a wheel that's actually not broken in this case. I think it works well. Thank you, Charles. Tina. I have two of those decals. Um, I think it's great that you only pay like $10 a year for those. Um, we, uh, it, you can get up to three cars on there. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, I'm, exactly. I think it's fine. It works well. It serves the residents. Um, 
I think, you know, the only thing, you know, when I first came to a commission meeting and I was in the audience and there was a guy who wanted to get the decal for free because he was a veteran. And I think veterans should get those for free. Um, I, the rest of us can pay for them. You know, it's, it's maybe make it free for uh, seniors, you know, 65 plus. I, I mean, a lot, most of them get the handicap tax anyways, which lets them park for free. But um, I think, I think it's, you know, I think it works. It's, it's good. I don't know why we have to make it free. It's, really low cost. I mean, I, if you if you go to South Beach, you'll spend more than $10 parking um, for just a couple of hours. This is a whole year. Um, I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm, I'm a little confused though, Mayor, because you mentioned a parking lot that's not utilized where you would have a tram pick people up. I don't know which lot you meant. I don't, I don't that's I the one where the utilized. sign. That's the one where the sign is proposed to go. Oh, that one, is, it gets full, like, because uh, when Publix is full, people park there. It, a lot of times it's not full, though. You're correct on that, but Thank I've seen you. it both ways. Um, I'm also confused because you have other documents here that are different. Um, I'm not, so I don't know the relationship between these other documents that are attached to this item. Well, but I, don't, I, you know, quite frankly, I don't know what items, what documents are attached. It's not a document thing right now. It's just a concept thing, and I'd like to see a motion, if possible, to move to uh, to at least not charge our residents to park their cars in town. I want to encourage them in any way I can to use the downtown and to stay here and to make it easy. You know, you walk into town, you show your registration, you get your decal, and then the, re the decal gets registered with that registration so that you don't get, you know, you don't have more decals going out, but the, the administration knows how to how to manage that. Go ahead, Nelly. I just wanted to say that, you know, it it's a sticker that you get every year. So if you forget to get the sticker, then you can potentially get a ticket for not paying the parking meter. So if you make one sticker that has no expiration and it's free, for residents, I don't think that that's a bad thing. No, but it's a bad thing, Nellie, because um, you don't want the stickers to go on forever. You know, because if, you, you know, if, if I think the expiration is good. I think, listen, if someone's a legitimate resident and they get a ticket because their tick, their their thing expired, I okay. think they need to Move come out. in okay, and, see and see the, the, the police department. And okay. if they can verify, you know, listen, they shouldn't get tickets, but... Again, I think it's just the, the concept. I don't think we need to make that. We 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 have the taxes are high enough. I mean, we again, I think it's 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 the theme. And the theme of Surfside, we've got a very special thing going on here. You know, in Aspen, they have music festivals, they have wine festivals, they bring the community together. You know, people start doing things together, and that's what I'm trying to encourage here. You know, so you know, let's get those electric carts going too one day. You know, I mean, maybe one day we'll have, you know, people will be encouraged to buy an electric cart that they can charge for free in the downtown. So that instead of parking three cars, you park 10 golf carts. And, you know, it starts to become a real community because we've got stuff that nobody else has. Hey, we've got free parking. You can go to the store in your cart and charge it there. We've got cool stuff like that. So I think it's just a matter of thinking a little bit out of the box and uh, I just was hopeful that this wouldn't be too difficult to get past because I think that we've got plenty of money um, to subsidize our, our residents for free parking. Go ahead, Charles. Sure, I would, I would gladly do it actually if it was tied into some kind of easy solution, like just taking the, the vehicles that are registered in this town in Surfside and doing you know blanket import of them into the database because it's all um, not toll by plate, but it's all um, you know ticket by plate anyhow. Um, in terms of in terms of keeping track of the cars and how long they've been there, um, you know it's it's all digital. We're we're not actually having anything monitored in the window or um, anything like that. So I think well, listen that that idea is you know? is spectacular. You know if if that can be done, that's spectacular. But I think it starts with a motion. Uh, from the commission to say, hey, listen, we want free and hassle. It says hassle free. You know, that's the whole idea. Not just, you know, free, but hassle free. 
free yeah, hassle free parking. Nothing, nothing would be less less of a hassle than if it's automatically in there because my car is registered here in Surfside. Okay, well let's let's figure out how to do that. But no, and I, I think have throw a question. Parks and Rec into that too because Parks and Rec I think is the is is even more of a headache to get access to where every year each individual has to show up with um, with bills and tax records and all sorts of stuff. Um, but that's uh, that's my vote for like a you know. Um, Can we do one thing at a time? Solution. Okay, I think. Wait, wait. I think Nelly had a comment, then Tina. No, I was just gonna say, and um, how much would something like that cost? I mean, I think that you're talking about something that's far more expensive than maybe just getting a sticker. I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know the cost of these things, but I know that these programs can get very expensive. Um, and then would you mean, it be? You mean the parks and recreation idea? No, no, no. The um, the idea about digital, um, putting everything digital, like people's on um, plates in in a system, and have them. Um, I guess the guy would come around with a little scanner or something and scan the plate and know that this is a resident or something to that nature. Um, and and the other one would be, I mean, would people have to? register more than once or like the same kind of sticker thing would it be like every year so that's or? a good that's a good question nelly just for fun um, maybe put this like on the on our but, website but hang on what happens what happens if 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 you go to a car and it's registered in surfside and it's parked wouldn't that be enough charles um yeah that's what i'm saying and i'm just i'm just shooting off the hip here right um because um I haven't done the research. I haven't thought about it, but obviously, if we if we have you know um, monitors like whether in Durrell or Surfside or whatever that actually scans people's plates as they go through and see if they're wanted, then they're all coming from the same state database, which certainly drills down to Surfside residents, and um, and it just is kind of one of those solutions where it might be a simple, obvious kind of free one. Actually, Commissioner Velasquez, that doesn't have much overhead. Um, but everything does have cost because you still have somebody in the, some personnel and staff that are actually overseeing it and, and doing that. But it's those types of um, types of technological solutions that are all around us, but we just don't have that many people uh, that are aware to, to actually think about them. Because right now they're, I think, outside of the town's box, so to speak. Well, listen, they're, they're, Tina, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, like, you know, I think the $10 a decal is really kind of an administrative cost and the cost of uh, probably producing those decals. And really, um, what I think what I'd like to see that I think if you want to make it hassle free, because it's really not a hassle, you get you get it and you have it for the year uh, to make it hassle free would be that, like, let's say I have I have the decal, I've had the decal, I have my car five years, so I've had the decal for five years. So um, but every time I get it, I have to show my registration, but they know me. And so maybe it, once you have the decal, you should be able to renew it easier. You know, well, how about if they if they have if they have your registration the first time and it the registration is in your name and you show your license, you shouldn't need to show your registration again. Well, but I mean, I just had to renew my license plates, you know, and, and not, you have to do that every year too. But maybe you and got I a different car. The car yet, but maybe, maybe you got a different car and you registered your car to be in New York now. So. Well, well, that's I know that's the issue, and I think that's why it has to be done annually, is because people move. So you can move and still keep the decal. So, you know, okay, I, well, I, look, I, I think I think the issue is now tonight is I, I just proposed that it be free. And I propose that it be hassle free. So to the extent that I think making it free would be the first step and then figuring out how to make it less hassle worthy would be the second step. And I think that the staff could do that. Okay. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't finished talking. Go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, the, it would be good if there's a simpler way to renew it. And, and that comes down to what uh, commissioner Kessel said about the community center cards, because um, you know, that, that's more of a hassle to have to renew. But I mean, things aren't, you know, these rules are put in place because people move and then they could still try to use the facility. So the same could go for the parking. And so um, I think, yeah, it, what we have works. Um, you know, I, I think as, you know, just as staff knows people and they know they're still residents here, then it would be good if it could be a little okay. smoother. Two different okay. issues, two different issues, Tina. 
Okay, one yeah, I know the, that. One is the hassle-free and one is the uh, cost. Okay, well, I'm fine with the cost. It's, you okay. know. Okay, okay, Nellie? No, I was just going to say, I mean, maybe something that um, people can do it online, like what Charles was saying, um, but more that, you know, you just put your, you can scan in your registration or something like that. Now, most of these things come with barcodes and different things that could make people, um, it make it easier for people to re-register, renew their, their um, sticker. All of that. Um, in terms of whether it's free or not, I mean, I agree with it being free. I don't, I mean, there's so much money that I don't see why there's no a reason that well, we listen, would charge our Let me let me do this. Can I get a motion then to 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 make it free? Um, I'll make the motion. Yes, let's make All a right. motion. Is there to a, make it free. is there a second for that? Not gonna get one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, well, That's you're gonna get sure. you're gonna get one because I'm gonna pass the gavel. Charles, are you seconding that? Um, yes, I'll second it. And I like the All idea right. in principle and, and just ask that maybe, you know, bicycles are supposed to be licensed in this town too. They actually are, are, have a, they're registered rather. And that's something that definitely should be free and they should even be incentivized. Like, well, so, well, you let's mean ask, like bicycles, please, bicycles? Please, I didn't know that. Motion, will you amend your motion to make bikes and parking Absolutely. free? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Is there a second to that I didn't even that know motion? that they had to be registered. All right. All right, That's come on, guys. It's, it's getting it's getting late. Okay. Any more discussion? Call the question, Madam Clerk. I have a public speaker, Mayor. Okay. Go ahead. Bring the public speaker in. Joshua Epstein, please state your name and address for the record in your comments. Joshua Epstein, 9317 BJF. I know whatever I say is not going to change it, but it's kind of ridiculous to get to do away with a ten dollar fee. It's more of just they have to come in and re-register. If you've ever been to the community center. A ton of people there don't still live in Surfside. They sneak in through IDs that they've lived here 15 years ago and now come back to the community center a couple years ago. This is $10 to park there an entire year. Parking there one day costs $10. So it's really so little money and it's just procedural. And why mess with something that's already been working is where I'm at on this. And I just don't think this is something. There's other issues that are more pressing than to spend, what is it, 15, 30 minutes on this, which is $10 for a year of parking. That's a no-brainer. And that's a bargain as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Call the question, Madam Clerk. I can't hear you, Sandra. Commissioner Castle? Yes. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. Vice Mayor Paul? No. Mayor Burkett? Yes. The other motion carries. Thank you. Okay. The I'm next sorry, item the next item is uh item nine F short-term rentals okay i put that on the uh the agenda a long time ago um because i had residents calling me to complain that the uh, the process was out of control and um i wanted to just readdress it with the new commission and make sure that we were all comfortable with actually the rules and regulations in place for uh, short-term rentals. And, uh, you know, Madam Attorney, are you able to give us a, a brief overview on that? Or is there somebody that could just basically give us a three-minute overview on what the rules are in Surfside with respect to short-term rentals? Yeah, I, I, I can do that, Mayor. Thank um, you. So we have a current ordinance in place. We adopted it in May of 2011. It does restrict the duration of short-term rentals. Um, it needs to be between one day and no more than six months. And we also have a frequency limitation. It cannot be more than three registrations in a 12-month period. Um, we're sort of grandfathered in with our regulations because the state subsequently preempted the regulation of short-term rentals to itself. And so it prohibits now municipalities from restricting or prohibiting short-term rentals. So we need to be very careful if you want to amend any provisions in our existing ordinance that we don't lose our grandfathering, so to well, speak. Well, let me and let me let me stop you and ask you. So with respect to what the state did, our ordinance still stands in full force. Yes, and because we do regulate frequency and duration, and that's no longer permitted, that's now preempted to the state. Okay. So uh, and we cannot modify those provisions without losing our, our status or our grandfather. 
So that sounds like we're sort of boxed in and stuck with what we have. And I don't know if it's good or not. I, I mean, well, it depends well, I, I, what, what what other areas you would look like to amend or look into. Well, I I think that the question I I saw from the residents that I spoke to was that there were no enforcement um, mechanisms, meaning that you know you had some residents that were renting over and over and over for a very short period of time and bothering their neighbors in the condos, and creating a nuisance. Is there a mechanism in the ordinance that that allows the the? Yeah, I think if we may, because I did speak to Carmen, our code enforcement director, today about this. Um, there is right now enforcement going on uh, to enforce the ordinance. If you want to bring her on and and discuss enforcement with Carmen, I think that's probably a good idea. Okay, well let's uh, see let's see if anybody on the commission has. Has strong feelings about this because it sounds like it's sort of baked into the cake right now. Um, and unless somebody wants to sort of understand it a little better, Juan, but go ahead, Charles. Um, yeah, this was something that I agree with you, Mr. Mayor. We were we were getting a lot of signals that it wasn't working. Um, it was hard to enforce, um, and it depended on which building you were in and who you talked to at the town. You know what the deal was, but um, um, I, based on my observation, you know, tossing it to the new town manager, who's no longer that new, and um, and Carmen did a code enforcement corner on it, and it seemed to really clarify what the issues were, and um, and straightened out people who thought that there were different sets of rules being applied for a certain special treatment. Um, that's my understanding where we are right now. But if um, if uh, Carmen or Andy could sh you know could shed a light on that, that would be great. Okay, then uh, is Carmen available, Mr. Manager? Yes, Jose needs to let her in. Okay. Yes, Tina, while we're waiting, go ahead. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I have to say um, the short-term rental has been in place, um, you know, like Lily said. And I mean, if you remember what Senator Pizzo said, they're still talking about it. The state still wants to preempt us. This is a hot issue in every municipality and uh, we're fortunate to have something in place. So I wouldn't touch this. I think that um, enforcement, it's tricky in each building, you know, when you live in a condo, uh, like my condo has uh, stricter rules than, than the towns. Um, the, the issue is enforcement and it's also, you know, catching the people because, you know, in a condo we get like, it's my cousin staying here and, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, on the weekends we'll see people we've never seen before. And, and uh, but it, unless you can really uh, prove it, it, it's hard to prove. And, and that's really the issue. Well, let's but see I, what the are, mechanisms for enforcement are. I see yeah, Carmen is- The regulations are very good. I, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't risk losing it. Well, no, nobody's proposing to change it. Um, Carmen, are you able to come on? Yes. Hi. Good evening, Hi. everyone. Can, Good evening. can you hear me? Yes. Perfectly. So as Vice Mayor was uh, mentioning, enforcement aid is tricky. Right now, um, we are enforcing the three short-term rentals within 12 months. Uh, we do respond to complaints. When we uh, receive a complaint, we do go on on and look into it. Uh, enforcement, it's it's difficult, and we're only responding to complaints. We're reacting. Why is it, Carmen, why is it difficult? It's hard to prove that uh, the people that are staying there are actually renting, unless we get some type of proof that they're renting through Airbnb or through any other system. We can't really, you know, prove it. So, uh, Unless you know they they willingly tell us that they're renting and how much they pay and for how long they're staying, so um, so that's one one part of the enforcement that's kind of tricky. Okay, let's see um, if the other commissioners have a, a question for you. Go ahead, Nelly. Sure. Um, I see here that we're talking mostly of, uh, regarding the condos. Um, what's the regulations for the house, like the single family district? Are are is there enforcement there or people, it's even more it, difficult yeah. than even in the condos. It's, it's the same. We, uh, the, uh, the regulations are town-wide. So everyone is, um, uh, th they're supposed to, to register every time they get a short-term rental. 
and it's the same for single family homes or condominiums. Um, same, as I said, the neighbor calls saying that, you know, I see, you know, people coming and going or different, different families every weekend. We do an, an investigate and if we find the violation, if we can get the proof, we cite. Okay. And do you get more more um, complaints from the condos or, or from the single family? Right now, it seems to be under control. There was a period of time where we got more complaints on single family homes. Last year, I would say it was more in condos and in some condominiums more than others. It seems that condominiums that allow, you know, within their bylaws to rent every week or every month, um, we we did get more complaints about it because there was, you know, some people that want to rent every week and some property owners that live there full time that they don't want to have, you know, different people or neighbors every weekend. So it, it depends. It's like, it's like waves. We get, right now it seems to be under control, as I mentioned, but, um, you know, it varies. Thank you, Carmen. Sure. If I could just ask while the mayor stepped out, um, if the condominium has bylaws that allow for more rentals, like every week even, which is more than what the local ordinance allows here in Surfside, um, can't we apply pressure to have them change their bylaws so they're in compliance? I'm not sure that we can't do that. Um, but, however, they need to to comply with the town code. So whatever is more restrictive is what they need to comply with. Okay, anybody else? Carmen, thank you very much. You're welcome, have a uh, good night. Good, good. Um, so I think that uh, we've educated ourselves on that and that was my intention. I don't see that there's anybody that wants to speak on that issue. Um, so we'll move along to the next issue, which is yours, Charles, quality control and quality assurance. I'm sorry, Nelly, I, think, I think we went over this one we that did. says excessive homeless. We did, I'm, I'm oh. waiting for more information. That's oh, coming back okay. next month. Okay, so I'm just gonna put it for next week, okay. Charles, your mic. Uh, yep, thanks, Mr. Mayor. And I actually have a presentation. If Jose has it in his back pocket, um, you can bring it up. I'll hopefully, hopefully I'll remember what the presentation is. <laughs> but uh, um, and if you if you have to look for it, I'll just wing it. When do you send it to me? I don't have. Oh, this is well. This was sent to you probably three meetings ago because I thought that we actually might get to this item. Uh, let me check on my email. Give me one second. Okay. So no, Charles, meantime, you have to entertain while you're sure, waiting. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll do my visual. Uh, exactly. Hand speaking, make gestures. But this is something that, um, you know, is, is um, on the surface hard to implement, I think. People think, oh, if we're going to be qualifying or quantifying measurements for success with every project, that it's going to be this tremendous overhead, et cetera, and... Um, and I think that's why it gets left by the wayside. But with this discussion point, I'm here to argue that by adding measurements of success, quantifiable measurements and goals to pretty much everything that we do, it puts a value label, value tag on our initiatives, um, on the work that the town does, and it makes it harder then for people to just forget about it. And, and uh, whether it's whether the people are the residents, um, a, an evolving town staff and who makes that up, um, the evolving members of the commission. Um, and, um, and when something has value, it's very easy to speak to residents and others um, about, about um, what value our decisions bring to the table. So um, let me just sum up like for consideration um, where you can attach SMART goals are setting goals to make sure that they're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're relevant, and they're time-based, all right? Um, and under consideration, we look at when we make decisions, the costs, both short-term and long-term, both direct and indirect, the impacts on the budget, 
to the environment, for example, um, to staff and the support needs. Um, I like to, I really like to look at feasibility and that really has to do largely with, does it fit with the town and can it work? You know, is it, is it a workable idea? Um, we come up with ideas, for example, on Collins to maybe, you know, the vice mayor has said, oh, we can put in some standing or some loading zones on Collins. Um, also, somebody mentioned the, um, the um, 45 degree parking rather than, um, rather than the parallel parking, which is hard for people to do, um, that perhaps you get more, more slots. Um, so that's something that can be measured in terms of, um, of what income you know, brings the town in terms of, um, you know, communicating with the business owners downtown to see if their sales have gone up. Um, if, um, if they were able to, to support more customers over a given period of time, as we propose to make changes to the, to the parking situation and, and the parking rules. Um, so everything that comes up, including um, Mr. Mayor, your idea for hassle-free parking for residents, you know, what are the end goals? Um, and, um, and I would argue that one end goal that I think is really worthy with this town is fewer touch points, like fewer touch points for the resident that that's trying to apply and, and get a permit, um, fewer touch points for even, um, paying a water bill, fewer touch points for, um, for, um, you know, getting access to, uh, to a parks and recreation pass let alone making a, uh, you know, scheduling an appointment to swim or to uh, have a match at the tennis center. Um, and with those types of goals, we can, we, can, um, we can see how our initiatives actually work or don't work and what kind of impact they have on everybody. Um, I, from what I see at the town, especially with the buildings department, um, you know, to a lesser extent code enforcement, um, they are really dying for some, some real simple workflow solutions um, that, that are often tied to technology, but it's also tied to, to smart goals. Like um, if we're turning around permits in X number of days, how can we lower that goal and make it achievable and realistic? Um, if people have to make you know, 10 touch points in order to get their permit, how can we maybe move that down to five? Um, so, and this ties into being able to measure the success of a project so that, so that after, it's, after it's rolled out, what are we measuring and what are we measuring against to define our success? I know that for myself, even as a commissioner, um, a lot of times I'll vote on something and then I'll wonder, hmm, I, I wonder how that's going to be, um, be how that's going to result. What is, what's going to, uh, to be the end result? So if by putting value on things, um, it doesn't mean that we're only a value driven society but it allows for justification and allows for understanding over time. Um, so next slide, please, Jose. I think, there you go. So, you know, that way you can have meaning across groups. We've got boards and committees that look at certain issues and then try to translate their, make their suggestions that, that, that trickle then up to us. And we, get, we need the town staff to buy in really to it. And, um, and I would argue that when the town staff doesn't buy in, um, you know, we see it and, um, and we get pushback. It may not be, um, it may not come across in a verbal sense. They may not explain it. Um, but we saw that pushback certainly when we, um, you know, when we encroached on, on, uh, on trimming the budget and, um, during, you know, during COVID and it's unknowns, um, we got, you know, we got some tremendous pushback and that was a learning lesson for me. So, you know, for residents, for future resident, residents, and for future decision makings, decision makers, anytime we can, we can um, put goals and value to our projects, it gives it meaning over time across groups. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so therefore, um, you know, and, and assessing the state of things, and we all know that, um, you know, people like to see numbers and people like to see proof. And, um, and we, see, we see that in a lot of aspects of, um, of business, society, even government, where they say, you know, what is, what are the dash, what's the dashboard and what are the metrics that we're tracking for success to monitor this, monitor this project? Uh, we saw a lot of metrics being used to monitor COVID, certainly. 
Um, and then when we looked to the police department, we were looking at, you know, number of stops, number of tickets, um, number of, um, of, um, of different initiatives from code enforcement and the police department for COVID, and then also related to traffic safety. Um, you know, we look at some of those statistics. Um, so, um, you know, to have assessments done so that we can have thoughtful lasting impacts on health, safety and welfare, and then sustainability and resiliency um, defined, you know, for the future, um, which is just the next few years as we're looking at the, um, you know, the idea of undergrounding the utilities. Um, but then, you know, 2050 sounds like a long way away, but if you get a 30 year mortgage, you're gonna be here for, for till 2051. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and we have to be making decisions that are actually gonna have, um, have a substantive impact that can be quantified. Um, so I think about this as we as we look at the charrette and as the think tank, then we look at our master plan, and then we look to, to zoning and code and how to better people's lives. And that could be defined as well, you know, with, with um, measurable um, energy savings, for example, calculated on a house. Um, you know, if you're if, if if we're trying to keep people out of the shadow of high buildings next to them, then we can actually calculate a, a um, you know a, a direct angle of openness related to sunshine coming in. Um, but whatever our our goals are, I think they need to first be clarified and identified um, to support the changes that we're making, or otherwise changes that we make and we spend so much time on could really go out the window if they can't be justified and explained. Um, next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, um, you know, assessments. Now it sounds, sounds really um, overwhelming sometimes. Oh my gosh, we got to do an environmental impact. But there are actual ways to, to do it that you don't have to hire a bunch of, of, of expert people to conduct, um, you know, studies that go on for months, if not years. Um, it can just be like a, a little like cheat sheet checklist that's done inter internally um, to kind of give the heads up so that we're not surprised when other things are, are, are showing up when we make decisions. Um, so as I mentioned, different assessments that can be done. Um, one that I didn't ma mention, um, although goals and success milestones, people generally love that one. Um, and it's not to set, set up someone for failure, it's to set people up for success actually and to have ownership on a project and to have the staff feeling rewarded when they meet goals and they're not just kind of forgotten about or abandoned. Um, but I didn't mention risk identification and mitigation. Um, you could put, you know, risks of a certain project can include lawsuits. Um, they can include um, um, bad social media, bad press, um, you know, lack of understanding, um, all these different things, but then you get ahead of how to how to identify, since you've identified the risks, they're not a surprise then when they do come up. And we have a lot of these, um, a lot of them are often the same, like, um, you know, complaining on social media or, um, or um, threats of litigation, right? We get those a lot. And sometimes the litigation, the threat of litigation has a little bit more potential for um, a real impact than others, which are just um, hot air. Uh, next slide, please, if there is one. All right, I think that's it. Oh, here we go. So tracking, I mentioned the dashboard of key metrics, performance goals, and therefore you can actually adjust things and readjust them as you move forward. And, um, and it can be part of the plan rather than having to, um, to come back based on whether somebody's paying attention or not to remember that that, that that was something that changed and needs assessment and readjustment over time. Um, so these things don't have to be overwhelming. We can start small. Um, in fact, we have with some things. I, I hear these words coming up um, now and then more often. Certainly, how are you going to define success? Um, that comes up more often, um, but it's only to our benefit to make sure that we're not wasting our time and that we're making decisions that will impact the town positively um, over time and that that can be understood and, uh, and supported and justified over time. Um, and next slide, there is another one. Okay, challenges, um, you know, yeah, the management and its leadership, the organization, are they able to, 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 um, to buy into this and support it? 
Now these are challenges. They're not pointing out weaknesses or something that's unique to Surfside. And this is for everybody. Um, is it bankable? Is it worth the investment in upkeep? Is it the right fit for the town and its people? You know, um, we we say certain things aren't the right fit, like like skyscrapers that uh, that take up every square foot of our property property uh, lines, um, but that isn't necessarily true for other towns. Um, so it just doesn't fit Surfside, and that's been defined over time. And we should can you know see how we can enshrine that. Um, Feasibility, meeting a need based on programming, for example, a need that really exists, um, or is it something that's not necessary? Um, is it feasible given the competition? How are we differentiating ourselves? And then, as I mentioned before, always looking at risk and overhead, but not being afraid to make big, bold decisions as, as we talk about frequently. Next slide. No more slides. Uh, that's it? That's All right, see, I wasn't sure how many I did, but, um, you know, I I, uh, I very much advocate put it, building this into our projects and our decision-making process whenever possible. I think it's good business. Um, I think it keeps uh, keeps everybody informed. It's good for the commission and it's good for the town staff. Um, even though they might not always see it like that, um, it's ways to, to, to set them up for success too. Um, rather than only only getting the complaints, um, but and to actually be able to communicate to everybody about the positive change that's taking place. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. Comments? Okay, I don't see any hands up. I, okay, Tina, you're smiling. There's your hand. Okay, go oh, ahead. I, I Yes, I just want to thank um, Commissioner Kessel for this thoughtful presentation and um, it, a lot of good points. Yeah. Uh, and it's a good note to end on, you know, something to think about. I agree. Good job, Charles. Thank you. Thank Nelly, you. Nelly, can't hear you. Nope, can't hear you, Nelly. I'm going to assume it's nice, though. Thank you all three. Yes, I hear. I see <laughs> so thank you to my fellow members of the commission. My my pleasure, um, Mr. Manager. We've got uh, four minutes left. You, you have an item on there. Can you do it in four minutes? Yeah, actually, I think Randy's going to lead you through that. There's some things he's already done in conjunction with this. So there he is. Okay. Hi, Randy. Three minutes, Randy. Good evening. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, th this was actually a uh, an item that was brought up to you guys uh, or the commission um, early on, I think right after you guys uh, were, um, were uh, voted into office. Um, what ended up happening was that the, uh, the commission requested a survey for anybody that wanted a light to, to sign up on the, um, on the website, we did that for 30 days. We actually extended it for 90 days after the uh, um, the pandemic had started. And uh, anybody that wanted a light signed up and we completed uh, that task. Um, I, 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 my recommendation for any extra lighting from this point on be held off until after um, the uh, the undergrounding because all of those lights that we have in the residential right now are con are connected to the poles that we're going to lose. Okay. Um, Great, Randy. I, I want to tell you, I, I know Randy's been working on this because we've had a couple lights in my area of town that were defective and not working properly. And he worked with FPNL to, uh, get that situation straightened out and did a great job. Thank you, Randy. Go ahead, Nellie. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Oh, no, what I was saying before was that that was a great presentation, and thank you very much, Charles. That was um, very good. Um, I also like to get a copy of that. That was really good. Um, and Randy, I I'm glad to hear that we've um put all these lights out that people have requested. I remember that we went out at the beginning um and assessed a lot of dark areas. Um, all over town, and I'm happy to hear that that these lights have been put down. Thank you. I put up. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, Vice Mayor. 
Yes. So, um, yes, I'm happy to hear the report from Randy as well. I haven't, I mean, when I'm out there, the streets are, do look pretty dark still. So um, my only suggestion would be if we're not getting requests for lights, that, that's fine. Um, since, since Andy lives in town, um, he could also maybe go around with Randy and look at the areas and see where uh, we might uh, want to add lights in and, and maybe check with the residents that live there to, to see that they want it because some people do like it dark. Um, right. But in the past, people have said they wanted lights and uh, I haven't heard anything recently. So good job. Yeah, I, Tina, make, Tina, I just want to echo that that sentiment because there are times when there's too much light and it, it affects, uh, it affects people being able to sleep well. So I think there's a, there's an important balance there that we've got to achieve. Uh, Nelly. Oh, I was just going to say there's one street, I think it's on Carlisle and I think it's like 90th between 90th and maybe 92nd that there's a lot of lights on that street and it looks really nice. I don't know. You want to take a look down there and, and um, see how that looks versus the rest of the town. I mean, Byron is quite dark. So, um, and, and I'm glad that we just, I just noticed the other day, we got a light right here in the corner that was out for years. So that was great. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Can I get a motion to adjourn? <laughs> okay. To adjourn. Okay. And all, great all, meeting. All, 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 those, all those in favor say aye. 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 A, a fantastic meeting with decorum, respect. Congratulations, everybody. Yes. Great thank job, everyone. I'm ending. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. And on time, too, right? Yes. Wow. Okay. Sleep well, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.